Good evening. Um, we always start every planning board meeting with an opportunity for anyone who came tonight to speak about something other than the Round Hill Clark School project. So if anyone's here for an extra comment period, this is the time. Okay, thank you. Um, we, uh, on the 26th, we um, opened a public hearing on the continuation of the hearing on site plan, uh, on site plan amendment of historic Round Hill LLC 44-52, 47, 49 Round Hill Road, map ID 31B-4 and 6. Uh, so that, the situation is we're still in open hearing. Um, I'd like to start by asking Carolyn to summarize the assignment before us. Um, I mean, it's still easy to get confused over site plan and, and, um, and, and exactly what we're being asked to do. So I think it wouldn't hurt us to hear what, what the sort of assignment to the planning board is. Then I'd like to see if the developer has any response based on the comments that they received last time. And then I'll open it up again for, uh, we, will, we will proceed with public hearing and if you've got comments, we'll take them. Um, I, yeah, I, I, a couple of things. Um, one, there's enough of us in the room that if you put your cell phone on vibrate and go out to take a call, that would be helpful. Um, two, um, because NCTV is filming this for the record, um, if you come to the podium, step up to the mic and say your name and, and that means you, your voice will be recorded. So we'd appreciate that. Um, it's, it, it would be nice if you're repeating a comment that someone else has said that you just add your voice to that vote and say, you know, I, I agree with my neighbor and, but I, I, I want you to have the opportunity for anyone who came out tonight to speak. That's the point. Um, I will probably leave public hearing open so that we do have the possibility for a dialogue but at some point after you all have had your comment period we need to begin our discussion so um, I won't formally close the hearing because that would prevent me from being able to ask the developer something so um, but I want your expectation to be that at some point we're going to have to talk about it among ourselves uh, and I think that's why you're here so, Carolyn, get us started. Sure. So, um, the, what's in front of you is a site plan amendment from a, a permit that was already granted, a site plan with a special permit um, in 2012. The site plan um, consists of requests for changes to the site. So it's not about the uses that will be occupying the spaces in the building. Um, those were already approved, office spaces and mixed uh, residential and office were approved in 2012. So what's in front of the board are changes um, to the site because um, the two, the build, the large gym building is being requested to come down. So that's a change to the site that triggers <coughs> the site plan. Um, as well as a second curb cut is being requested to be located in the middle of the site to occupy or to access that proposed parking lot and then the reuse of the um, power plant was not originally envisioned in 2012 so that's um, um, on the table for discussion um, for uh, renovation and use for residential structure um, units and then the parking that um, is associated with that and then finally the request to um, create a separate lot down at the um, westerly end of the property at the end of Bancroft wasn't originally envisioned in that 2012. Normally, um, lots with um, frontage, as you know, are allowed to be carved off without planning board approval. But since the entire parcel came in under the original site plan, um, it stays in that mode forever. So anytime there's a change to that, that would trigger um, so that is also a piece of the conversation. Okay. Um, ready to go? One presentation. Um, prepared to talk to us? Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Good evening. 
I'm Michael Sedell. I'm an attorney, uh, and I represent Historic Round Hill Summit in 1924 LLC. I am also one of the owners of Historic Round Hill Summit. Um, since I sat and listened to the comments a few weeks ago, I thought it was important that I speak up tonight and say a few words. I want you to know that on December 8th of last year, after providing notice to the neighbors, uh, Mr. Hebert, uh, Mr. Tom Douglas, and Mr. Rob Levesque presented the development plan for the west side of the campus um, to the neighborhood, and it was about 40 or 50 people attended. Mr. Hebert at that meeting talked about the fact that he wanted to relocate his technology company uh, to uh, Gaywith Hall, which would include substantial renovations tearing down the gymnasium to accommodate more parking and rehabilitating the remaining portions of the campus with residential and business uses. Mr. Douglas presented large drawings of the proposed renovations and Mr. Levesque presented large drawings and a detailed explanation of the parking area and that it would fit within the footprint of what was being de demolished in the gymnasium and the other impervious surfaces. So again, if you um, if you're familiar with the campus, there's an existing parking lot, there's tennis courts that are asphalt, and then there's the gymnasium. The meeting lasted for hours. Uh, we did not leave until everybody had an opportunity to ask whatever questions they had and uh, made sure that, uh, we made sure we introduced our project manager our on-site project manager, the person that's there every day who maintains an office on campus. Uh, we made sure that everybody had met him. Uh, we introduced him. Uh, we made sure they had his number, his email, and that where his office was located on campus so that if they had questions, they could reach out to him. Based on the positive feedback um, Mr. Hebert received at that meeting that night, um, he proceeded with the plans that are for you tonight. So it wasn't without um, full disclosure to the neighbors, a opportunity for everybody to ask questions and, and time to understand exactly what the plan was. It was then over the next few months that the plans were more developed so that then when they came to you they were detailed, but these are essentially the same plans that were presented uh, to the neighborhood. And, and again, it was after input with um, the planning department and incorporating the requested um, modifications by the planning department. Um, so it did involve demolishing the gymnasium, it did involve developing a parking lot, and it did involve the renovation of Gayworth Hall. By way of background, the, and uh, Ms. Mish just spoke to some of the issues, but in the site plan approval, um, but I did want you to know that the site plan approval did require uh, us to have cross easements with Clark School for drainage, uh, to agree to a historic preservation restriction, to uh, make verifications regarding our stormwater and drainage from all the buildings. It required us to spend 103000 for all granite curbing along Round Hill Road, the installation of bike racks, the installation of no parking signs on Round Hill Road because the neighbors were concerned about uh, traffic and parking and all that. Uh, it required certifications by arborists. It required replacing sidewalk panels. And we just didn't piecemeal the sidewalk panels. We replaced the entire sidewalk. Um, and we installed handicap ramps. Uh, during that process, we had drainage analysis. We had traffic impact and access studies, and we had peak hour trip generations and parking calculations. And we actually prepared with the guidance of the planning board a formula to figure out when a unit was occupied, how many spaces that was gonna take so that we didn't overburden um, the parking on site. And that was because there was a need, uh, there was a request at the time for a waiver of the parking requirements so that they would be, the requirement uh, would be reduced by 20%. After lengthy hearings at that time, and, and uh, Ms. Mish pointed this out at the last time, when we bought the property, we knew we wanted to do um, apartments 
in Rogers and Hubbard. So if you drive up Round Hill Road, the east side has two buildings, Rogers and Hubbard. The west side has uh, seven or eight buildings. But we knew we wanted to do Rogers and Hubbard as residential apartments. We had plans to do uh, both apartments and businesses on the west side of the street. So she is absolutely correct. The plans were not definite. And we were talking with lots of people about what uses would be appropriate up there. We talked with schools. We talked with fitness centers. We talked with nonprofits. We talked, with, and we talked with um, a variety of people about converting for residential uses. We talked with nursing homes, and so, but none of the uses really seemed appropriate for the campus, and so that is how it evolved into. Um, Mr. Hebert uh, considering this as an option for his, uh, his business. Um, but after the lengthy hearings back in 2012, um, we, uh, this board entered findings. And the findings were that the requested uses protect the adjoining premises against serious detrimental uses that the requested use will promote the convenience and safety of vehicular, trip, vehicular and pedestrian movement, that access by no motorized means will be improved, that the site will function harmoniously in relation to other uh, structures and open spaces, that the requested use won't overload and mitigate adverse impacts on the city's resources, and that the requested use meets any special regulations set forth in the city's ordinance. So it wasn't without um, a lot of consideration, a lot of effort, a lot of expense that we went through the process and obtained uh, the permitting. Um, as I sit and sat and listened to the comments made at the last hearing, I, I got to tell you, I was a little shocked to hear questions about the use of the property. I was shocked to hear residents complaining about the lack of research regarding the soils on the property when there's a 265 page report filed with the city and approved by the DPW regarding our drainage and soils and the like. I was surprised to hear complaints regarding the lighting. Frankly, from our standpoint, we're not here to shed lighting on neighbors' property. We're not here to hurt anybody. But there's safety issues. There's concerns when we have 37 apartments on the east side of the street that people who live there can get into their apartment. And when it's winter and icy and dark, then that's when people slip and hurt, get hurt and fall. And, and uh, we don't want that. We don't want to shed light on anybody's. We understand there is a clear need to keep the lighting on our property. But we also understand there's a gigantic safety concern. And we feel the residents who are going to live in those apartments have every right to have a well-lit pathway uh, to their door. Um, and then finally, I, I, I felt the opposition started to get very emotional to the point where there were claims that weren't supported with any facts. And again, we've invested millions of dollars into Rogers and Hubbard. We've built beautiful apartments. They will be available in Hubbard on July 1st. They're magnificent. We've had open houses. We've had people think they're fantastic. The reason why I'm telling you that is construction's been going on for almost a year. And with the exception of one instance that started before we even had construction, which was a dump truck, uh, a dumpster that got delivered 15 minutes before 8 o'clock, which violated the ordinance, and the contractor that did it was told it never happened again. But with the exception of that one complaint, we have not had a single complaint concerning the entire project to date. I feel we've been responsible in the way we've 
managed the construction. Our contractor has been very respectful of all the neighbors' concerns. Uh, none of our contractors park near the street. We park them all off-site and within our property. And again, there hasn't been a single complaint in a year. I will say uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to speak up is because I heard an attorney at the last meeting say he lived in an abutting property for his entire life. And he knew that he had water in his basement and mold. And yet, it's the same lawyer who's called me for years trying to buy property or limit develop on that, on that abutting property. And what was told to me was that he decided to buy a house on that same street where he grew up, knowing there was water and mold in the basement, and without any basis whatsoever, he claimed that building this parking lot was going to cause more water in the basement. And he actually told Mr. Hebert that if he didn't agree to do what he wanted him to do, he was going to require, he was going to ask for geothermal studies and technical studies as a way to leverage Mr. Hebert into conceding that he should give up the right to develop lot four. That's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. I had another lawyer call me this week that said if we didn't, re if we didn't withdraw the request for that extra lot, that he was going to stand up here tonight and absolutely contest the development of Gaywith Hall. And he said to me, we have no objection to your development of Gaywith Hall, none whatsoever. If you give up your right to develop Lot 4, we're not going to say a word. He even said, I'm not even going to show up. That is wrong. This is a public, open process. We are entitled to our rights as somebody who owns the land and is doing what we think is a wonderful, beautiful, historic preservation project. It's wrong to be held hostage. We are completely, we completely understand and are <coughs> sensitive to the neighbor's concerns. We don't want traffic. We don't want lighting. We don't want, you know, major changes. But I can tell you, we are very proud of what we've done with these historic buildings. Their presidents have lived here. They, these buildings are, in, are, it's important that we preserve them. And so to have people come and threaten our livelihood and, and right to develop because they are not getting what they want, I, I just don't believe is a basis for you to deny a permit. Um, I would like to invite uh, Tom Douglas, the architect on the project. And again, uh, one of the things that was said to me was that uh, our architect was misrepresenting things to the board. I can tell you I'm insulted by that personally, and I'm, I'm insulted that somebody would challenge uh, Mr. Douglas is in, or uh, Mr. Levesque's integrity. They're both long-standing professionals that have worked tirelessly for years in this community. And to say that they misrepresented anything is absolutely unequivocally false. In order to make sure nobody has any misunderstanding of exactly what he has said in the past, I'd like to invite Mr. Douglas up to talk about what the design and the development of Gaywith Hall is, and specifically the what's called the courtyard, the area between the two buildings that uh, apparently people have uh, an issue with. I'd also like him to speak to the lighting. Um, we're absolutely listened to the concerns of the board. We've listened to the concerns of the neighbors. We're prepared to talk about construction impacts to the Pratt House, a protection plan for the trees, um, landscaping and other plantings, and any other issues 
that the planning board feels are appropriate or reasonable or need to be addressed. We, we're here and we come in peace. We want to make this a project that you will be as proud of as we are. Thank you. seats in front if somebody doesn't want to stand in the back. Just click on which this one. Yeah, that's it. Do you think I so have them on? So getting to the slideshow, which I can't do now. It can, but you might not be able to see that screen very well. It'll take a minute to start because it's a I just had, um, while this loads up, um, I, I had two clarifications to make. Um, so there, were, there was one issue last week that I brought up about uh, the addition to Gaywith that we're planning. and. Uh, zoning bylaws state that we can add an addition to a historic building like this as long as the addition has in it a stair or an elevator. So what's up here in front of you, this plan here in pink, shows you the addition we're making to the <coughs> It's an alleyway between the two existing buildings and we're uh, enclosing that. And you can see in the middle of that pink area is a green area. And that is a handicap ramp. So in long discussions about a year ago about this project, we uh, determined that an elevator serves the same purpose as a handicap ramp. It's either for convenience to get up to upper floors or it's a handicap access to a building. So we're adding a ramp there, a handicap ramp inside of our addition to access the first floor. So that's why we felt like we were within the spirit of the law, if not the letter of the law, the zoning law, allowing us to do this addition to the, uh, the footprint of the building. So um, the other question that came up this week uh, from the lawyer who uh, questioned what we were doing at Gaywith was some of the areas that we're adding that are second floor projections or uh, roof canopy projections. So those you can see in yellow there. There's a little triangular section right up there that we're adding. It's five feet at its deepest point. We're adding a roof canopy right there over the new main entrance. And like I said, that's the handicap ramp right there at the main entrance. So this is the roof canopy we're adding. And then we're adding a little sliver of second floor projection there and there. So those areas of, that project beyond the second floor have no support on the first floor. They're completely supported by cantilevering from the second floor. So they, there's no footprint whatsoever on the first floor. So we made the determination that we were not increasing the size of the footprint because we're not touching anything on the first floor. We're not adding anything to the first floor footprint. And the other issue about that is this is the existing plan. So you can see in yellow are existing, uh, at the top right there is an existing porch with a roof over it. And this is an existing roof canopy that projects out from the building. And then this is an existing ramp that gets you up into the building. That was their back handicap access right there. So the reason I show this is because you can see in yellow, um, there's existing 345 square feet of projections coming off this building currently. And if you go back to what we're adding, we're adding or we're proposing 308 square feet of second floor projection. And this is, again, this is 
projecting from the second floor with no first floor support. The existing plan here has, that's a porch with columns on it and um, a platform that sits on the ground. So we're actually decreasing the footprint of the building in this area here, uh, sorry, in that porch area there. We're taking away the, um, the porch there and we're just allowing the second floor to project beyond it. So I'll just show you um, the first floor, the entry, that's that roof I was talking about that's existing there now, it projects from the building. That's where our roof will be. So there you can see it again. Here's that porch on the side that I was talking about, it has a roof over it and columns and a um, concrete deck there. And this is a close-up of that entry area. So this is the area that we're enclosing right there and we're, we, the ramp will be back here. And then that's that existing roof there and then this is an existing step. And then this is that side porch that I was talking about that is larger than the extension that we're doing right here. So we're pr pulling out our second floor right here and extending it out five feet at the point. Uh, that's an existing porch that's already there. So here you can see in the model what I'm talking about. This is our canopy over our entry. There's a little projecting second floor sliver right there. There's another one right there. And then this is the largest one right here that projects out five feet from the right there on the second floor with no supports below it. And you can see it above where we're cantilevering out the second floor there. And, that, and then that's the roof deck right there. So um, we need to get approval to do this enclosure of the existing space between the buildings, that little alleyway. And I think that we're within the letter of the zoning law <coughs> by having a handicap ramp in there that allowing handicap access to the building. Um, so that's that one question. The other question is lighting. And I, I'm only showing the lighting because um, I've done a little bit more work after last week's discussion. Um, everybody knows that this is the existing historic fixture that's on the south side of the property. This is the new light that we're proposing. It's the same thing <coughs> we showed you last week. The only reason I'm showing it to you again is because um, there'd been a question about that little thing right there is, is a glass, uh, it's called an acorn, it's a little glass uh, diffuser. Um, and the question was, is that gonna be visible from below? And the cut sheets show you that that acorn that diffuses the light, the bulb is way up there, the LED bulb. This is just a diffuser, so you're not looking right at the LED diode. And so that is tucked up underneath this metal shield to cut the light off as well as can be done for this uh, a nice historic fixture. So there's the, um, the fixture we're proposing. Same as last week, 14 feet to right there. Here's the canopy. You can see that that acorn is up in here. And I, I think that this is about the best fixture we could get because the light source is tucked up inside of that metal canopy and we've brought the bottom of the canopy down two feet lower than what is um, the maximum allowable in that district, in the URC district. So we're lower than what um, is required. The th we are, we're only gonna have, uh, we have uh, three <coughs> foot handles is what is the maximum allowable in this di district. We have, this is a photometric, so right at the very center, we have 1.85 foot candles right at the very center of this fixture. And you can see 25 feet out, it's 0.1 foot candles. Um, and there's a better diagram of it. And so um, this was the exact same lighting plan I showed last week. Rogers it hasn't changed at all. Um, this site uh, is new. What I did this week was inventory all the light fixtures on the campus, <coughs> with the exception of what's at the gym. I, I, I disregarded what's at the gym. There's some big floodlights in the back of it, but I just disregarded those. So I looked at um, you know, what would remain if we just didn't do anything. Um, obviously, we're not gonna, we're gonna do a lot of work up there, but what would remain? So in the back here, you can see the back parking lot back off of Bancroft. There's two really large floodlights back there that have a huge spread. Um, I think the pole is up about 30 feet. I didn't measure it, and I didn't measure the light distribution, 
but it, they are large, unshielded floodlights shining down. And the same thing happens at the boiler house. The same thing happens around atoms. They're just wall-mounted, big wall packs that are halogen uh, lights. Same thing happens all the way around Gaywith here. Just big wall packs mounted up about 20, 30 feet, something like that, that have a big distribution and no shielding at all. Um, these lights right here are those uh, more historic looking fixtures um, that I showed you that, that people seem to be happy with. There's a couple of them that are shielded. I think, I think that one or that one, I can't remember which one. There's two of them that are shielded that block the uh, light spill over to the neighbors. So we propose to keep those. Oh, and well, going back, these three big yellow spots right there at, the, at Round Hill. Sorry, I'm trying. Oh, right, the, those are the street lights there. I don't know what the spill is, but they're the big cobra head fixtures. So this is our proposed lighting plan. Um, it's just showing a broader site plan than what I showed last week. So this area right in here and the parking lot has not changed at all. What it did do was show that we're going to eliminate the, um, the big wall packs and the big pole mounted fixtures that are back here and we're going to substitute them for the new fixture that we're proposing that has a full cutoff and is only at 14 feet and has a fully shielded um, light to it. So and then we're going to keep these right here like I said the street lights stay there. And so um, I think that's that's pretty much the gist of what what we've done that I've done that's new. So. Any questions? Well, we have questions for Tom. Yeah, Tom, um, on one of those lamp <coughs> posts, uh, it might be that first green dot on, on, the, on the existing drive. Oh, yeah, on it, this it, plan? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> it just looked like maybe the, the shield was oriented in a way that didn't protect the, the property to the, to the left. That one right Yeah, there. you see how that it's kind of protecting the, the street side. I just wondered, was that intentional? Oh, no. Well, actually, it's, it's hard to tell, but the shield is wrapped around the back of that. Yeah. Uh, so that the neighbors over here, mm -hmm. the Mr. and Mrs. Gross live on yes. that side. So mm -hmm. they're the ones that are being shielded from it. Oh, okay. To me, it just when I looked at it, it just seemed like it was shielding the street more oh. than meant their property. But No, that's... um. That's, uh, um, the lights, Carla, the, that that they're showing that they've selected look a lot like the ones that are. At no, I mean it's existing. So oh, I know that's the existing one, but the new ones that he's showing look to me like they're the same ones that you were using on campus at Smith. Yeah, no, I, I don't have a question about the new ones. Yeah, it, it was just that existing. Yeah. I thought if there was a way, if it was oriented. Well, we, we can certainly add the shielding to it, but well, I don't know if it needs to be added. But okay. if, if you just you know yeah. make sure that that's oriented Sorry. right. To me, it looked like it was shielding if you were going along the street, and the side was open to the. Okay. It's um, a 360 degree shield, isn't it? No. No, it's just the back back yeah. half of. The, no, you, you guys know. That. Wait, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'll let you all have your time, okay. but we, I don't want to get away but from. I, I, I we're completely I happy shield, though. completely happy to alter the shielding of any of those lights on that side to, to protect the neighbors more right we're totally happy to and do that. and I wanted to pick up uh, what I started to say Carla I didn't misunderstand oh, you, oh okay but there I, I believe the same lights you're using are the ones that are on Smith campus and I have been using those as a good example as we've talked about trying to put new street new lights in town so if anyone is wondering what those lights look like, the, you can go up, pretty much see one. I, I, the way where I look to see those, I think the newest location is back there behind the infirmary, yep. where that's a new parking lot, and they're spaced 40 feet apart. Um, and, and that was the model we're using. They're only 11 feet. The, she, the bottom of the globe is 11 feet off the ground. We're 14 feet off the ground. Okay. But I got the spec from Smith College. We're using the same direct mixture, just a little higher. There. Alan. <coughs> Hi. Could you go back to the image of the, the elevation <coughs> showing the section, some portion of it in yellow and the, some oh yeah, the brick colors? Building plan. Right. Yeah. Uh, that maybe I wasn't listening carefully enough, yeah. but I, I thought 
your description of the additions to the building that you would make were pretty minor. A few feet here, a few feet there to uh, uh, allow for a handicap ramp. It's this. No, no additional, um, no addition to the footprint, uh, et cetera. But then if you go back to that picture, it looks, if I, is the part in yellow the addition? Um, so this is the proposed plan. The part right. in pink? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the elevation, not the okay. floor plan. Okay. Uh, Right. So, so is what? So what are we looking at there? Um, so, um, currently, this the, that sliver right in there is where we're at. We're enclosing the alleyway. So it's it's not that entire section because from here to there is existing building that we're tearing down. And, and the part in yellow there, or buff color, whatever. Oh, uh, that. It is. Well, so that. That is um, that. Uh, what we're going to do is take that building down to its foundation, and then rebuild it up on top of the existing foundation. So we're not expanding the foundation anywhere. The only new foundation <coughs> we're adding is right there, that sliver. But everything else is built on top of the existing foundation. We're d and so we're going to build a high-performance building with new uh, wall cladding and new roof. Right, so it's new construction, but not addition to the footprint. Correct. Is that the point? That's correct, yes. And, and um, the reason we can do that is because it's not a historic asset. It was built in the 60s, and we can take that section down. Um, and it still wor works out to be a, 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 it's not a full demo to, to Gay with, n not anywhere close. It's, a, um, I can't remember the percentage right now. So could be construed as a small amount of demolition to Gayworth, and it's also not an expansion of the footprint. Well, that, you, did I understand you to say that would be taken down to the ground? Just to the foundation. Okay. We'll right. keep the right. foundation. So that's a total demolition and rebuilding of that portion. Of that 1960s section, right. yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah and, and that, that, I've already been through the Historic Commission and gotten approval for that. Okay, I have no more questions of you. Um, you could leave your presentation in there if you, so if we have to come back to it. One more okay. presentation. <coughs> Hello again. Hi there. Uh, good evening for the record. Rob Levesque from our Levesque Associates. Um, I'm going to try to address, if it pleases the board, what I'll do is address the comments that we got last time rather than go back through all the information. Here for a moment. So I provided the board with a letter um, dated uh, today, basically describing the, um, I kind of categorized the, the questions and comments we got last time. And uh, if it pleases the board, I can kind of paraphrase and go through that. Great. Please. Uh, item number the one. The letter will end up on the website, but Great. so paraphrasing will be fine. Thank you very much. Um, so we had questions related to the landscape, landscaping and screening in two specific areas. Um, after the last public hearing, I had an opportunity to meet with your planner, and we looked at the plan specifically. Um, along the Pratt House uh, property line, there was a concern that we didn't have, that we didn't carry our landscaping towards the front, which was a good comment. What we have done is we've increased the, um, the extent of the berm towards the front, towards Round Hill Road, and we've also provided additional evergreen plantings along that edge on that on that berm. I think there was a comment from one of the butters, or maybe uh, they had mentioned that they preferred that versus a fence. Uh, so we did stick with the berm, and we brought that forward. We've also, uh, we added on the back side of the boiler house, we've also added landscaping. So that there was a concern about car lights shining down on the access road between the, L the engineer's house and the boiler, boiler house. And they wanted to make sure, I'm sorry, yeah, the engineer's house and the boiler, engineer's cottage and the maintenance building, sorry. Um, and as they come down, they wanted to make sure that they didn't, didn't see that. Um, so we did add evergreen planting. You can see that right here along, along the back side. you see that? Okay. Yeah, so the driveway comes down and turns to the south to get to the small parking area. Correct. And that will 
impact houses on Bancroft and possibly on over to Crescent? There's, I know there's a house at the corner of. We, we did look at that specifically, and I actually went out. There were some questions related <coughs> to the tree inventory and what had been kind of located from the, by the surveyors. Was two, our surveyors as well as uh, Heritage Surveys had conducted a survey. Um, I went out. What have we do, we've done is added to this plan. Do I need to speak into the mic or is that okay? Yeah. Um, it would be best. No. Yeah. Um, what, we've at, what we've added to the plan uh, is the existing vegetation back before that lot four begins. So you can see all of those round circles are existing, a lot of existing pines there. There's also some, some mature deciduous trees. Um, you can see what we've added for the landscaping. But if you go and you, if you go on that back slope, that is really revegetating. There's, there's, there's quite a few dead trees along the roadway. We actually were, we had them listed to be protected. We've changed our tree inventory. I went out in Field Truth this uh, the other day, and we, we've made sure basically that what we have is consistent with what is either being impacted or what doesn't need to be protected. So we've updated that. But essentially, what you have there is you have the evergreens that we're going to we're proposing to protect against any lighting. But we took a measurement; it's approximately 250. I'm sorry, I think it's like 205 feet from the property line, and there's. There's quite a bit of mature, mature vegetation. I do have some pictures uh, that I, if I can find them in my presentation, I can show you. But there's quite a bit of vegetation on our, on our way down that slope. Okay. okay. Um, so we've added uh, those two areas to the landscape plan. The rest of what you see is consistent with what you saw last time. Uh, if there's any specific concerns, we're obviously willing to address that. One of the comments that I made to the planner and we discussed was, was that we don't want to overplant this. We don't want to be pulling trees out in five years if we don't have to. But again, if there's an immediate concern on screening, we can certainly address that. I did look adjacent to the, the uh, Pratt House right now. There's a, a number of arborvitaes that they've planted directly adjacent to their uh, HVAC units. I think there was a discussion about the HVAC units last time. So if arborvitaes or something like that were, were requested, we can certainly accommodate that. But we do have evergreen plantings shown along that edge. Um, there was a question about access road width. We do have a 24-foot wide access road proposed. There's existing vertical granite curb down on the edge of Round Hill Road. So we're planning to tie in with granite, vertical granite curb into that, uh, which is fairly unforgiving uh, when you're driving a delivery vehicle. So the thought process was to provide the, the, the requisite radii so that we wouldn't have trouble with, with emergency vehicles. We'd like to stick with the granite curb down there. Um, it is a little bit wider at the throat because right at the, um, as our 24 foot wide access drive comes down, it obviously bends out with the two radii on either, either side. So it's a little bit wider, but we'd like to, if, if the board um, would accommodate that, we'd like to leave it the way we have it proposed. If not, we would have to change the material that we're using down there um, or to some adjustment to that curve. Excuse me. Are you talking about the proposed cut? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I think Tom covered the lighting, but I, just, I did want to point out that um, the, the lighting that we're showing on the plan is consistent with the requirements of time or the uh, standards provided uh, time saver standards for landscape architects specifically um, there's there's a table that describes what type of lighting you need in certain areas i actually had a concern that closer to the building that we're going to be a little bit darker than we should be um, typically they're like in in certain areas with ramps as we have in in these pedestrian access points i'd like like it to be a little bit more more well lit but i think we're comfortable with what we're proposing um, but we are consistent in that one foot candle that, that Tom's talking about is what's suggested in time saver standards. There was some question about the southern access. I should probably bring that up. So the southern access, which is this, if you can see my cursor, it's this area over here. There was some discussion as to how that would be handled. I know there was some discussion last time, questions about emergency vehicles and whether or not they could get in. So we have, they would like to maintain that um, this building right here is a very viable building on campus. They'd like to continue to keep that viable. Um, they feel that you're, there's no immediate parking in this area and there's, there's no real um, access to this, but they would like to kind of keep this available uh, as needed and especially for delivery vehicles. As, as I mentioned before, as you come in on this curb cut, you come around the back, you would back in the delivery vehicles here to the loading area, and then you'd be able to continue around. In order to prevent normal vehicular traffic, 
Uh, we have proposed and I have a cut sheet of removable bollards. They, um, they're fluted removable, removable bollards with chains in between. We would propose three uh, along that access so that it would be completely closed in the event of a delivery vehicle needing to get in there, they would be able to remove those. I don't think it would happen often. They might find altern an alternate route, but that was uh, what the applicant would like to stick with um, and would, would really like to maintain that access. Um, or I'm sorry, for, but for only for delivery vehicles. Uh, as far as the, I have a, a little area here regarding open space calculations. There was some discussion about lot four last week, and we, or two weeks ago, we wanted to make sure that we kind of described the open space, because I don't think we actually provided a calculation. So we went back and we did a calculation of the open space. There's a 30% open space requirement in the URC district. So just to give you a little breakdown, um, there's a 30% requirement. We have 51.2%, so we're well over the requirement. And if you were, if it was ever to be broken up or if this permit were to be broken up into either side of the street, because there is currently right now two proponents, so it may be logical to do so, um, we would wanted to show you that we would still be compliant. So we would still have, um, if we broke them apart, we would still be compliant on the west side. The west side would still, with the creation of lot four, would still exceed the requirement at 39.4%. And currently on the east side, we have 65%. So we are compliant, no matter how we broke it down, we're, we're compliant with open space. We thought that was important to point out to the board. And again, a little bit more on lot four. We read through the URC district regulations, and I kind of paraphrase the regulations <coughs> in, in this item, but essentially it says that they're looking for, um, you know, single, uh, single and multifamily housing. Uh, in this particular case, we understand that if we were to pursue something on, on lot four that we could do that anything under 5,000 square feet without site plan approval. Um, anything that we did on, is that not correct? Anything unless anything other than a single family home is under 2,000 square feet doesn't trigger site plan. Right. But then there's a major and there's an intermediate major. 5,000 is for a major project. I'm sorry, 2,000 square feet. Okay, thank you. So, so again, the idea here would be that this wouldn't be a, a major residential development, but there's a viable lot there. It's beautiful houses in the neighborhood. There was a number of questions related to, and I think there was some confusion about surface water and storm water and impacts and neighborhood impacts. So, there, so we kind of categorize this all into surface water and, and, and groundwater. And what we did is we went back through, we went through back, back through our report. Mr. Seidel, and our attorney Seidel had mentioned that we have a 200 and some odd page stormwater report. That's based on a lot of work. What we've done is we have soil evaluator, a certified soil evaluator and a professional engineer um, look at the stormwater both pre and post development. And we not only look at the soil types, we look at the topography, we look at the cover types. Um, all that gets looked at. There's a program that we use to analyze that. We have empirical, we have data from test pits that we've conducted, not only in the area of the subsurface system, but also surrounding that area, pretty much at the top of, of the hill. And we describe that in here, but essentially I want to point out a few, a few things. The, are the required setbacks under the DEP stormwater management standards for any of these subsurface systems and also for recharge facilities. All of those standards have been exceeded by you know, tenfold. There's, there's, there's basically um, a requirement that you um, have your subsurface infiltration system uh, 10 feet away from a building. We're, we're, I measured on our plan, we're about 205 feet with our subsurface infiltration system at the boiler house away from the nearest property line. Down on Crescent, that, that's, that's to Crescent. Beyond in the backyard to the house, it's probably another 30 or 40 feet at least to, the, to those home locations. Now there's a 25 foot grade change from the bottom of where our infiltration system is to where the houses are. So we are up on a high point, obviously, that everybody's aware of that. And then we have, uh, we've dug down, and we have not encountered seasonal high groundwater. Our soil, soil evaluator did not find seasonal high groundwater up there. And we're not contesting the fact that these folks down in Crescent probably do have seasonal high groundwater. And again, 
there, there's these folks have water in their basement. So likely what's happening is those basements are sitting in seasonal high groundwater. So we're way up the hill. We're way away. We exceed all the requirements for stormwater management. Um, we have provided that information to the DPW and engineering department, and they have reviewed that. We feel confident that there will be no impacts to the surrounding um, homes based on groundwater recharge. The, the system that we've designed recharges to a point, and then it utilizes the existing system. The system that was there um, was substandard in our, in our mind. So what we've done is we've basically upgraded the existing system on site. That system always tied into a, a drainage system on Bancroft. We've upgraded that. We've increased the size of a few of those pipes, and we've provided all new structures all the way down to Bancroft. So that will, hydraulically, will handle more, more loading. The driveway was a concern of a neighbor. Uh, they were concerned that the driveway from the boiler house would be removed, and then if it was removed, that sluice way or that uh, almost looks like an alpine slide uh, that currently carries the water to Bancroft would no longer intercept water. And that is somewhat accurate. Uh, removing impervious surfaces from, from that slope that will be reseeded, regraded and seeded right in the area of the uh, driveway. There's about 60 foot length of, of that will that will still be left temporarily until they figure out what, you know, what will be happening, if anything, with lot four. Um, and then the boiler house parking lot is now picking up any water, any, anything that's been inter that hasn't been, in been intercepted before from up gradient is now being intercepted by the new parking lot, goes into a catch basin structure and into our subsurface infiltration system in that parking lot at the boiler house. So that's all basically being, create, uh, being handled. These, these, um, there, there is right now, and, I, and I, when I was out there checking the trees, I looked at it again. Right now what happens is the water shoots out of that sluice way into Bancroft and then runs down all the way, all the way to Crescent to the intersection. That's the very first catch basin location that there is. So this is going to be a big improvement, and they should expect an improvement in that water that currently shoots out onto uh, Bancroft. We did look at the surrounding properties. I looked at the grades of the houses on Crescent. It looks like they've been built up a little bit from the street. I don't know the history, but I'm assuming that was done because of the groundwater conditions. That's usually an indication. And then, uh, is there anything else on stormwater? Any questions before I switch off of that? No. Sorry. Okay. I'll hurry up. <laughs> Thanks. And then construction impacts. I can skip over that, but there's a very detailed pre-demolition survey that's done by the, uh, the contractor. I spoke with him specifically about how he was going uh, to demolish the gymnasium building. And basically, he'll start from the northwest corner and work his way in surgically um, to make room. And I can get into the details of that if any of the abutters have specific concerns. Okay. Any questions? We can. Trees, yeah. We, we did provide a, an updated list, and it's, it's at the end of the, <coughs> the document. There's an updated list of trees, and that was field truth. So that's part of the document that... It should be the last, one of the last pages. On the mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, question. Um, I see you've attached an exhibit of trees to be removed, significant trees to be removed. But you don't say whether that's an increase or decrease over what we proposed initially. I believe it's a decrease. I believe there's, uh, we, because there was about, I want to say it's six or eight trees that we were proposing to protect that we're just removing. I don't know if you see that on the, uh, on the breakdown. Well, it's hard to compare to what you proposed two weeks ago. I have the document that I proposed two weeks ago. So you'll see that we have a total. All trees to be removed right now are 449 inches. See that there on the left, yep. left hand side? Um, significant trees to be removed is 304. And then there's dead trees to be removed. Those are back, and I can show you on the, on the plan here. It's right back along that driveway where there's a bunch of dead trees. There's actually one across the driveway right now, but there's a bunch of dead trees there. So I can go back to the other document to give you a comparison if you bear with me for one second. There was no, while you're looking for that, there was no way you could figure out to save the 
40 inch or 36 inch trees? They're the, the 40 inch that I believe you're speaking of is just smack dab in the middle of our parking lot. I was disappointed. It actually was listed on the other survey as a 10 inch oak. I believe it was listed initially as a 10 inch oak and it's actually a 40. It shows on the plan as a 40 inch. We have, we've updated it since, yeah. So, but, but there's no way to save that? Not, not, not really, no. The top no. of that tree is also dying. There's a lot of dead, dead growth in the very top of that tree if you look at it. I think that might be a different one. Well, it looks oh, pretty yeah. healthy, the one oh, I would yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 one that, the one that we're... That one's the one between um, Round Hill Road and, and the gymnasium. Yeah. Excuse me, which tree is this? Just for comparison, since we look at all of them, from our apartments? A 40-inch maple. I can... The huge one by the tennis court? No, no. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, so there, there's, it's right in, it's right in here, pretty much smack dab in the middle of our parking lot. <coughs> and the, I think the one that Tom, Mr. Douglas was talking about is just down, just down gradient of that, which is right here. That, that's got a damaged trunk as well. So in terms of whether you've increased or decreased the number of trees? So we have a total, um, all trees to be removed in at last, or two weeks ago, of 403 inches, and we have 449 inches that we have confirmed. So technically it's an increase over two weeks ago, two weeks ago based on further investigation. In the size of the significant trees? I have 304. 304 number change? Yes, it was 224. Mm. With 111 inches of dead trees. Yeah, I got the 111. Okay. Any other questions? I have a couple of questions. Um, about the planting plan, um, on the lower parking lot, you're showing those are pine trees that we've planted on the slope of that um, going up to the parking lot. Is there, um, so I think the plans say three to four f um, foot tall with, upon planting, is that right? Caliper, three, three to four inch caliper, but we. Is that what it is? Three to four inch caliper, sorry. So, um, Given that they're planted um, in a dispersed way along that slope, what is the um, uh, project? What do you think those? Um, how tall will those trees be at the level of the parking lot? So if they're on the slope down, how much um, screen will it provide um, above the actual surface of the lot? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the, close, the closest uh, trees to the parking lot edge of pavement are about three feet below the parking lot grade. Okay. And uh, if you wanted to give us a minimum height that you were looking for, I think that would probably be easier just to guarantee because I, I've seen variations, significant variations in height. Right. I mean, they should do what they're so if you, Yeah, right. So I guess the only question, right. So the question would be, um, for the board would be you'd want a screening that upon planting is at least three feet above the grade of the parking lot because that's about where headlights are right. so as cars come down I mean the only issue is the grade coming down the hill they'll be slightly pitched a little bit but I think the standard that you typically have is, uh, is a three foot high hedge around a parking lot to make sure that happens and it, would there be any issue with as the tree Rows with the lower limbs falling, you know, dying back, and that then the Over screen time. really is above the parking lot as opposed to sque continuously screening the parking lot? Over time. We, we, I would expect to get these would be fairly fast growing. Um, this is all mature pines over here. Yeah. And that's what's happened over time. I don't know if they're, they're, they're probably 100, I don't know, 100 some odd years old, but. Um, over time, yes, that will happen. So I wonder if it makes more sense to have something that's lower growing that's a continuous screen for, I mean, because the idea is that screening the headlights, and so as it grows, it's going to lose that capacity, it seems like. Um, so I don't know, something for the board to think about. Okay. 
Um, and then I just had another question. You mentioned on the, about the lighting and concern about um, around the building. Isn't there's not? I assume there's going to be a light over the door, the entryway, so that will provide additional light beyond the site lights. Oh, at the boiler house? Y no, mm -hmm. oh. at the um, gateway. Oh yeah, uh, in the canopies, yeah. Like okay. The projecting canopy, there'll be some down lights. Okay, so there really shouldn't be a concern about safety around the building because those will be on over the doors. Right. Okay. Great. If there was. Uh, the proposed extra lot, are additional trees have to come down? If it was developed? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would think so. I would think so that's that not included in this. Right. Well, we're, we're not including any development in this, yeah. in this project. But I think you can attach that as a condition because it's in site plan now, so you could have it so that any future buyer or user knows up front that, you know, to site the house in a way that as minimizes. minimizes the impact or is required right. to replace yeah and that hopefully helps the neighbor that has concerns and that has hired an attorney maybe it will save some money okay Should I do? yeah you had mentioned um at that back of of lot number four that there's already uh, plantings and screenings that exist on the down on the, on the down yeah towards crescent yeah there's there's a uh, rhododendrons. There's there's deciduous trees. There's there's a bunch of stuff, and there's a lot of scrubby vegetation that's popping up as well. Well, that that that's what I wanted to ask you a minute. It, it, what's your thought about? Because you know I I can't necessarily tell by looking, but I wondered if a lot of that scrubby is invasives, and if that's what you're counting as screening. No, it's not. Okay. Um, there's there's some pretty mature vegetation. There is some staghorn sumac and some other stuff that's mm -hmm. popping up, and that's certainly not what I was counting okay. as, as screening. Okay, thank you. Okay. Don? I have a question for Carolyn. Yeah. So how does the math work? 449 inches of trees can be removed. Well, it wouldn't be 449. It would be 304 because... The replacement requirement kicks in with trees of 20 inches or below. Instead of 111 coming to any calculation. No, because dead or diseased trees, right, don't, right. So um, I'll have to, I had a different number um, going back a couple of weeks, so I would just need to calculate that um, now. And I'll would you explain that again? The 304, there's a requirement that they be replaced in what way? Right, so there's a new ordinance the city council adopted literally two months ago <laughs> um, that states that any significant tree that's taken down on a property that is subject to site plan approval by the planning board, um, and significant tree is defined as a tree that's 20 inches or greater in, um, at um, uh, diameter height. rest height, um, that there be a replacement um, of um, based in caliper because small trees when you plant them are sized in caliper mm -hmm. um, and there's a formula in the zoning so you have to replace um, a spe specified number of new trees to offset the elimination of these significant trees um, and if you can't replace them on site the remainder there are other options to uh, replace those trees in the public right of way throughout the city um, or make um, a payment to the city for other trees to be planted at a future time. So uh, the removal of a 30 inch tree could result in the requirement to plant many new oh, ones, right? right. Yes. And so that's the number John was asking, what's that number, what, what does that mean? And the minimum tree size to replant is um, two and a half inch caliper. So, um, you know, if there's 100 caliper inches worth of tree, um, you divide that by two and a half to get the total number of trees because you want a minimum size upon planting. Okay, I'd like to open it up for questions to the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're still under uh, open meeting. So, yes, sir, your hands up.
State your name, please, and stay next to the mic. Um, I'm Mario Grosso. I'm one of the four unit owners in Pratt House. And uh, I'm new to this. If there's anything that's not the purview here, just stop me. We just have some very specific concerns. Uh, and if it's, too if it's not really germane, let us know. We have an easement from the school. Our sewer lines are tied in to the old school sewer lines. We assume that there's not, not going to be any renovation on the sewer lines. And that's going to be respected because otherwise we won't have sewage. Okay. You'll have sewage. <laughs> well, we'll have sewage. <laughs> we won't. Uh, we're also concerned, uh, since you're talking about trees, in front, near the front of the property, where the gym is coming down, and in the middle of what looks like our lawn but actually belongs to you, there are two magnificent beaches. Those are going to be protected? The, the yeah, yeah speak, speak to us and we'll. Okay, I'm we'll sorry. You, I'm yeah, sorry. we'll get you the answer. Yeah. It's, a, it's my weak effort to maintain. I'm sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, can you answer the beach tree question? Yes, sir. The, we are aware of the beach trees. I went out and looked at them. There's one that's damaged at the top or, or diseased or damaged at the top, and that will need to be addressed. Can you do it by trimming it as opposed to taking it down? I have to. I, I would check with the arborist on that. But. Um, is that the one at the those street? Are, those are planted to be made, to be left. Okay. okay. Not touched, untouched. Okay. Um, and there's two things that maybe it's not the purview, but we've never heard addressed. There's a building we look at called Perkins. I've never heard anything about it, what's going to happen. And there's also a huge back parking lot, which I've never heard if it's going to be maintained, torn up, renovated. Can you tell me where that parking lot is? Okay. It encompasses the whole back mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. it's the old parking lot. It's the old parking lot that goes across the whole back of the old school on our side of the street. East side. So this is the, on the downhill so side. Gay with is right here. Gay with is there. Yes. Where's, where's Round Hill? Right this in the Pratt house. Where's, where are we? I'm sorry, I'm near, not seeing near, the okay. cursor. Right, right. Right there is yeah, Pratt the, House. There's a huge parking lot that runs mm -hmm. all along here. That's in the back. Yeah. Here, right, there. right. Is that anything happening there? There are no plans to, to impact that parking lot. There's no, there's no plans for that building back there. But there's no plans for Perkins at all? Correct. Is that, is that building on the historical thing so it's protected? Yes, I believe Okay. So. Which one is Perkins? I don't know if it's, it's called Perkins or not. Skinner. Skinner. Yeah. Skinner. Well, I was told by my housemates okay. it's Perkins. I'm so sorry. this is the building right here, if you can see the cursor. Skinner will That's get renovated. You can't see this cursor. Skinner will get renovated to National Trust standards. Thank you. And um, there was some mention of the housing on the east side needing overflow parking. Would that be in the new proposed lot? because we were wondering whether we were going to have people coming in day and night in that lot. <coughs> we're not objecting, we were just wondering. I can, I can speak to that. Um, there may be temporary overflow parking um, while Hubbard is finished. As I said, that should be ready July 1st, but Rogers is still under construction. So in order to preserve a safe environment, we may have, and, and to stage the construction, we may have some overflow parking in uh, across the street on the west side. But our ultimate plan is to have enough parking on the east side to accommodate all of the apartments. And so we may be coming back to you to describe to you how we want to accomplish that Thank as well. You, just to clarify, the original permit did allow parking from the west side to be utilized for the east side. All right, thank you, sir. It looks like you were four for four. And the last question, which is really just a, a suggestion, now that that huge tree that we face is coming down in that parking lot, is there any feasible way to consider to having that as sort of in the parking lot, like they do some, or is it too much of a safety hazard or anything like that? Just a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Next. Can I, can I say one quick thing about yes. Pratt House? Um, we do plan to, to get together 
right. with you guys on a weekly basis during demolition and try to lay out the entire schedule and stay on top of all your concerns because because I, I know that we're very close to your house and we don't want anything to happen to your house it would be a big legal problem for us so we really want to be careful about that thank you thank you Cass. yeah I've got one in the front row then you yes sir all right good evening I'm Dorkin Skiba and Crescent Street and we've you have heard from the proponents about the apartment buildings that have been built but I don't think in the our last meeting anyone questioned those apartment buildings our questions were about the proposed 90 space uh, parking spaces increase in this proposal for the check writers operation in Gareth and that means we are talking about about 100 cars coming in each direction and changing the character of the neighborhood. And this is what requires this additional parking, which is sort of symbolic of that increased tech, um, uh, parking spaces required for this new industrial business. And after we, the last meeting, I went back to myself and uh, we thought, that is the impression arising that we are against or uh, further uh, business development in Northampton. This is not the case. But it's a question, where do you want this kind of extra traffic, 90 or 100 vehicles coming and going each time? Do you want it on, in a previously residential <coughs> area, going up the narrow, round, steep Round Hill Road Aren't there other properties in the city? I was just thinking uh, the last parking lot next to, um, opposite, uh, next to uh, Costa Ferrar and where the former car dealership was opposite <coughs> where the uh, Florence Savings Bank is on King Street. If you have a business with 90 cars coming and going every day, uh, it should be near other businesses which would appreciate that traffic as customers. But what you are doing instead is we are being asked to approve a plan to inject this industrial enterprise into a previously residential area. And that is something very problematic. If the plan were to put residential housing in Gareth Gav Hall or something, I, didn't, I don't think you would hear this concern because you wouldn't have these hundred cars coming and going every day. So I'm asking you in the, for this, in the interest of having this kind of a business, where does it belong in Northampton? Does it belong on top of Round Hill or does it belong in an area where it is adjacent to other businesses they would in fact appreciate having that traffic as potential customers and neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> I'm just going to keep the mouse. I have to move the mouse so it doesn't go to sleep. Okay. So it's like, <laughs> um, I'd also like to add that late in the day today, the planning office got uh, two letters that I just want you to know that we've gotten. I'm not sure that all of us got it in time to read, but one was from Sarah Metcalf. Uh, who was concerned about overarching climate change issues, uh, concern about nighttime lighting, concern about uh, an increase in the number of parking uh, places and tree survey clarification. And the second letter was from Ed Linehan on lighting on motion detectors, uh, the height of the lights, uh, landscaping of the corner buffer uh, and parking spaces, tree inventory, use of lot four, and a hydrology study. Sorry to have you wait for that. Thank you. Um, my name is Attorney John McLaughlin. I represent Mr. Nelson on Crescent Street. I am the attorney that called the applicant's attorney. And uh, I'm not making, I didn't make any secret threats. I said to the applicant's attorney exactly what I said in writing here last time and what I said in person here last time is, my client has good legal arguments against cutting off lot four from the existing site plan that it's part of. 
my client also has very good arguments to show that the reconstruction of Gayworth Hall is flawed and has some real legal problems. And I to said if we could just resolve the lot four issue so that there's a nice buffer between my client's property and the development, I wouldn't put up more of a fight. But they insist upon going forward with everything, not changing anything, not making any accommodations. So I had to come here again tonight. And I filed a written opposition also. Um, yeah, for the record, I'd like to, we, we got your second yes. letter, so we've all read that. I'd appreciate if you didn't go through it in detail. Okay. Actually, I we just got it. I have just it had it on my oh. desk. So I just handed just <laughs> it to you, so I don't. Yeah. I just changed it. Um, yeah. Summarize that for us. Okay. Yeah, it would have been nice to get this. I mean, I know yes. it's strength yes. of time. But yeah, to we walk into a meeting it. and the meeting well, starting. I, I was talking to the applicant's attorney as late as last So I had hoped that this wouldn't be required, but I found no accommodation, so I had to. And the applicant's attorney also got very angry at me for saying things about their prior statements at the last hearing. I've given you a transcript of what was said at the last hearing, and you have the plans in front of you. Um, so I'm sure that might have inspired them coming forward with their corrections before I got here today. But you can read precisely what was said, and you know what the plans show. So that is the, the truth, and that's where we're at with that. So, so basically, um, you had some objections to Lot 4 before. Now I just want to talk about Gayworth Hall itself. In my written presentation, I set forth the actual bylaw, which is the main legal document that governs this entire process. Please understand, nobody has the right to build any kind of office structure in this district by right. This is not a neighborhood that's meant to have office buildings in it. The only way you can put an office building here is if you're doing it to save a historic structure. That's it. And there's a long bylaw there that you should read or at least take a look at because that is what everything is based upon here today. And it's long and it's complicated. And it, but one thing it doesn't say, it does say that if there's a part of the historic structure that's ugly and not historic at all, you can tear it down. You can do that. It doesn't say you can then go and build a brand new, modern, bigger, taller structure on top of it. It doesn't say that. They are asking us to imply, to infer. It's going to be up to you. You're going to have to do this because somebody's going to have to say what this bylaw means. But read it. It doesn't say that they can do all this reconstruction on the footprint. It simply doesn't say that. And because it doesn't say that, I submit that you don't have to give them that. It would be nice, they'd like it, they don't want the old dirty building, they want to build a brand new structure, and they want to tag this modern structure onto the historic building we're trying to save. They say they have a right to do it. I don't see that in the bylaw itself. The way I read the bylaw, it says that they can use the entire footprint of the historic structure, even the newer part that's tagged onto it. They can do that. Uh, they, can under, they can undertake construction beyond the footprint, beyond the footprint, only to accommodate an elevator or a stairway. <coughs> That's it. Uh, they can demolish the non-historic additions, but then it doesn't say anything about it. And then you can build a massive new structure. It doesn't say that. But they want you to infer that because they, they can make more development by doing that. So firstly, I, I say that because it doesn't say that, You've got to look at your bylaw. Your bylaw is basically a restrictive bylaw. I cite a provision in your bylaw that says, any use not listed shall be construed to be prohibited. That's what your bylaw says. Your bylaw is a fairly restrictive bylaw. You shouldn't go inferring things that aren't listed. It's, it's a bylaw that says if we don't, you know, for property owners might not like it, but it basically says if we don't say you can do it with your property, you can't do it with your property. So they're asking you to infer this right to build this massive new building when it's not explicitly stated. Also, you wonder, well, what did they have in, what did, they, what did they have in mind, the drafters of this provision, when they, when they wrote this? Did they mean to have people build on top of the footprint of the older, of the structures they demolished, the non-historic structures? I submit that one reason you can say no, they couldn't have is because they've given you no guidelines. No guidelines as to what can be built on the old, on the 1960s structures that they tear down. You would think that if 
the drafters said, okay, you can build on it. Can you build a modern structure? Can you build something postmodern? Can you build something, what, do you, what can you build there? How, what are your guidelines? The, well, the bylaw doesn't help you at all. So I submit that's one reason to construe that they don't have the right to do this. They, they would have the right to use the existing 1960s building if they wanted to, even though it's not historically significant, if it's attached to it, but when they, and they have the right to tear it down. But I don't see the right to tear it down and build whatever they want, and that's essentially what they're doing. And so, so it's up to you to decide, do they have this right or not? But even if they do have this right to build this new structure, they've got some real problems. Um, the, the first one, uh, the courtyard. I, I've submitted there precisely the courtyard or the alleyway, if you want to just call it an alleyway. You can only build outside of the footprint of the original building to accommodate a stairwell or an elevator. Um, there's no stairwell or elevator in the, in the barrier area they're building over. And understand, this is multiple floors, so they want this but they have absolutely no right to it. And you can't modify a bylaw. You're the planning board. You can't give a variance. If it doesn't fit the bylaw, they simply can't do it, reject it. In that particular element, I don't see any argument. And they've made misstatements. Maybe it was by mistake. Maybe they were talking about the uh, handicap access is the same as an elevator. I don't know, but that you can read what I put there. I've got a transcript of what they said last time. Um, I'm going to give you about five more minutes. Okay. All right. The, the next thing is they talked, I, I did point out to Brother Council that portions of the second floor go way out. <laughs> and they said, well, there were overhangs before in the old building. That doesn't matter because the, the rule is that it must be within this, whatever the construction has to be within the footprint. If they can build at all a new structure, it has to stay within the footprint. It can't be that there's a foundation and it balloons out over the uh, foundation. Um, also, another thing is that they're only supposed to demolish the non-historic elements. But because this new building that they're building, which is taller, which is bigger, which is of a different design, because that new building is so big, they can't fit it without tearing down part of the historic gayweth. If you look at the plans, they're actually not only talking about building on the footprint of what they're demolishing, but they're talking about demolishing part of gayweth to fit their big new building. That is absolutely not allowable under the bylaws either. That's not true. This is not true. Wait, 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 wait. Just let him well, have well, it say. Okay, you guys all have the bylaw in front of you. You have the bylaw in front. We had it written. You have the bylaw in front of you, but they're taking out windows. They're taking out. As I read the plans, I didn't have an expert look at the plans. As I read the plans, they're doing stuff to gay with to fit this building in. Lastly, I'm getting back. I, I saw windows becoming doors. That, that finish. Wait, Tom. Wait. I don't care about the National Trust. I mean, you should. I'm asking you to I'm summarize. Please. All right. I do, I do want to get to lot four. It, okay, lot four is really why my client was here. Uh, it was <laughs> lot four. <laughs> that you, in 2012, you gave a special permit. That special permit showed that this was going to be part of the area for this major development. Now, they c they, they've tacitly admitted they have to come to you for permission, but they've given no grounds to change it other than they want to develop it and make more money. That's not a good ground. Your bylaw doesn't set grounds. There's very little case law. I set forth a Supreme Court case that says you have the right to make reasonable conditions when you do a site plan approval. It's perfectly reasonable to say that you can't change what, what you did before unless you give us a reason. The last applicant, the Opal, when he came here, he could have cut off that for an ANR. He didn't because he knew it would have been a hard sell to get this major plan done with a smaller lot. So he doesn't do it. Now they come in and try to change. They should be equitably stopped from changing their mind now to try to get more lots out of this. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you in the back corner. Sorry, I can't call you by name. But give That's all right. I'd be worried if you could. <laughs> my name is Andy Bachelor. I, I live on Henshaw with my family. Um, I apologize. I checked online today to try to read 
the applicant's most recent submissions and I could not find them. So I'm going off of what the paperwork was described, but um, I can't read it, so uh, you'll have to bear with me. But um, uh, two main areas I wanted to talk about, and, and they fit into the overall idea that I feel that um, the 2012 plan is being taken apart piecemeal. So there was an approved plan in 2012 and that there's going to be substantial changes to the approved plan, but the applicant is doing it bit by bit to make it seem like there's less substantial changes. So parcel four is being carved off. There's the big parking lot on the west side uh, being uh, submitted here today. And I just heard for the first time that there's a planned parking lot for the east side um, for the apartment buildings over there that they're going to expand that parking lot. At the first I've heard of it, they said that they're going to go for that in a second application, but I feel like that de defeats the whole purpose of a comprehensive site plan. Everything was considered together, and when we're talking about the parking, when we're talking about the lighting, when we're talking about the development of the site plan, when we're talking about amending the existing approved site plan that's only four years old, we should really talk about the whole thing and not do death by a thousand paper cuts where we take a campus that um, had a suitable but small amount of parking and completely switch it over into uh, basically the largest parking lots, or private parking lots in downtown Northampton. And so um, I noticed that as far as I can tell, there's been no submission from the plaintiff that changes the parking spots and there's no suggestion of reducing it um, by 30 to get down to uh, 229, which I believe is the regulatory suggested number for development of this side. And I was speaking with the applicants last time afterwards. It might be that there's a reason for this large number of parking spots. And if they're not, if we don't have this large number of parking spots, maybe they'll have to build more on the other side or maybe people will park down on Crescent. But none of that's been mentioned. There's been no offer of proof. They're going off the old uh, traffic study. They're going off the, that there should be actually fewer cars now than before. And so I ask um, that this board, when they make their conditions, have the conditions reflect the whole site plan so that we're not back here six months from now when they want to do something to Skinner that changes it slightly. We're not back here two years from now when they want to do something from the east side. From what I could tell you, uh, from what I could hear when talking about the tree survey, it sounds like the tree survey was done exclusively to the west side of the property. But there are some massively beautiful trees on the east side along Henshaw where I live, and those are in a state of disrepair. If you walk along Henshaw, you can see the exact border between Magna House and the applicant's property because Magna House cares for their property and the the new the applicants on the other side don't, so it's all overgrown. I, mean, I could be wrong, it might not be the exact border, there's no flag there, but it seems to match up with what the property is. So um, I think that this development will be, I, I speak for myself, I think this development can and should be good for the neighborhood. I think that the applicants by and large have listened to a lot of the concerns about lighting, um, about the demolition from the people who live next door in Pratt House, and they've been responsive in that regard, but it seems like they've decided the number of parking lots, the parking spaces that they've wanted, and they're not going to change that even though it's drastically more than the regulations suggest should be there, and that they're slowly, slowly, part by part, taking it apart and doing it, and I ask that you put conditions that whatever, if you approve their plan, they haven't offered another one, if you approve their plan, I ask that you impose conditions that the entire site plan, all included, parcel four, the other side, not have any more parking so that we don't go through this fight again on every little step. Thank you. Thank you. You in the second row and then you in the back corner. Remember your name. My name is Fraser Beatty. I live at 83 Round Hill Road. I am a direct abutter to the East Campus parking. Um, by Mr. Seidel's definition, I am a reasonable neighbor because I do not call the project manager at 6.15 in the morning when the construction trucks start backing up. They may not be working, but they're backing up. So I'm a reasonable neighbor. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, I'm seeing plans today. Uh, I see paperwork being referred to um, that I believe is a recent submission, perhaps today? T tonight. Tonight, okay. So my question is when will that be made available? to the neighbors for our review. Um, I find it very difficult to comment or review um, and take a reasonable position on something when we haven't seen it. Um, having it flashed across the screen very quickly here is really not useful to us. 
Um, I am delighted to hear that there's more landscaping being proposed um, around the parking lot. Um, it's been responsive to my neighbors at Pratt House directly across the street. Um, however, I too would like to see additional landscaping um, around the east side of the parking lot as it comes down to the street um, and we would be happy to provide specific comments around that to the developers. But I do think it's important that, you know, the neighbors be screened from the parking lot appropriately to keep the historic um, and beautif beautiful natural um, environment that we have today. Um, I do have a specific question around signage. Uh, we have not discussed signage in this meeting or on May 26th. Um, there are, in the original plans, page C12, um, there is signage uh, shown at both the new driveway cut as well as on the northeast corner, and I'm pointing up here because I can see it, uh, the northeast corner um, of the parking lot wall closest to Round Hill Road. And I'd like to understand what that signage is. Um, why is there signage pointing towards residential properties? I totally understand signage at the driveway that would be appropriate for anyone arriving to look for a business and where to enter. Uh, but I'm not sure why we need to have additional signing at the corner of the lot. Um, and I will end my comments there. Thank you. You, sir. Yes. And Janet, after that. Hello, my name is Michael Horan. I'll try to be brief. Um, I've heard a lot of great comments tonight from my fellow neighbors, um, especially Mr. Bachelor's proposal to do uh, whole site plan um, revisions. Uh, it would be very helpful. But I also want to say uh, that I am actually very well in favor of a lot of these plans I've seen. And I consider Mr. Seidel and Mr. Hebert my new neighbors. And I'd like to see them uh, fairly considered. Um, I've heard, I, I was surprised to find that some of my neighbors have hired counsel. I hope that there is uh, due consideration, fair consideration for all of these things. I myself look forward to having the gymnasium removed. I think it's a blight. And I think a lot of the, uh, honestly, a lot of the comments sound like it's just comments for common sake. And I hope it's not going to gum up the, uh, the works to have some of this stuff done. Um, obviously, uh, we want to consider the health of trees and sight lines to existing properties. But frankly, I, I just hope that this board is fairly considering the proposal that our new neighbors have put forward. And can we get your address for the record? Sorry, 127 Round Hill Road. Thank you, sir. Hi, thanks. Uh, Janet, you were next. <clears throat> Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road. I'd first like to read just about three sentences from Sarah Metcalf's letter. Sarah lives at 93 Bancroft. This is her conclusion. I am disappointed generally that the plans for the campus show no awareness of the looming and present threats posed by climate change. No solar panels, no passive heating, no effort to incentivize use of park and ride. Since the developers lack awareness of the need for local and individual efforts to curb the use of fossil fuels, then I would like the planning committee to do everything it can to help shape these plans in a manner that will be consonant with the goals of a sustainable Northampton. And then speaking for myself, now it wasn't clear to me what is going on with the lights at, on the south side of the campus. You're gonna retain those original structures. I don't know his, how historical they are. They probably went up when that drive was put in, and I think that was in the 90s. I mean, it was fairly recent. The lights are very, very high. The um, shield that you see um, still allows light to um, trespass into our yard. I think that shield it was really put on, not for our benefit, but because it would, it conflicted with the um, street light. And apparently that sort of conflict is a problem for drivers. Um, and I also am not clear whether or not there will be any sort of buffer between um, the, what is essentially a business park 
and our property. Thank so we, we really need to see the plan. Thank you. Um, this and then you. Hello again, I am Buck Degendorf. I live at 88 Round Hill, which is also known as the Yale House, and it's right next door to the Pratt House. Uh, this sketch that's up right now that we're looking at, I'm assuming that's the most current version, which means they really haven't changed anything since our input from two weeks ago. What I would like to do is show you a few things. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to talk for a long time. And I <laughs> am not going to give you legal arguments, but what I would like to talk about is what Mr. Mr. Batchelor started with, which is we want to be good neighbors and we want check writers to be a good neighbor. And my concern is that what they're doing right now doesn't necessarily qualify as uh, showing this, themselves as being good neighbors. Uh, so I'm going to go through this quickly and I, I'll be talking about the screens. Uh, the first one, of course, is the uh, drawing uh, uh, C6, which is the uh, site plan. And I showed you this last week. This is just focusing in on their plan. And what you'll see, what comes to mind are those red marks. Why is it 35 feet from the road? Why is it put right on Round Hill Road? I'd like you to just think for a second that you're standing on Round Hill Road, looking up where the gym is now. Okay, the next day it's gone and you've got beautiful open space with lots of potential. We could turn it into a big asphalt parking lot or we could maybe have some green space in there. When I look at how close it is to the road and since last uh, session when I looked at it again this time, it's right on top of the Pratt House as we all know. So I suggest that we can move things to the back and I'm gonna show you in this presentation all of the space that's available back there to do that. This is what I suggest. If you'll compare the two, all I've done is I've taken that retaining wall in the front and moved it back. Probably saves that 40 inch tree, I'm not absolutely sure. The other thing is, it takes the portion of the parking lot right next to the Pratt House and moves it over. In summary, what this plan shows you is that their version had 115 parking spaces. Uh, 98 in the front and 17 in the back. My suggestion moved 40 of those seats or spaces to the back so that you've got 58 in front and 58 in the rear. It's one more space, 116 spaces, one more than they have. It's a rough drawing. Their architects can clean it up and save trees. I think we can save one or two in the front that are doomed. Uh, it would probably cost one pine tree in the back uh, when I walk that area. If you, what, what bothers me about these sketches, by the way, is if you look at this when there's a change in it, you'll see that you see the Pratt House. It's not this broken line off to the side. It's the outline of the building. And you'll see next to it is the Yale House. And you'll see across the street the President's House where the Beatties live. Our good neighbor is showing just his view of the world, just this site plan. It ignores this. What he's doing is building this in the middle of this neighborhood. And he doesn't show the surrounding homes. It looks like it's a self-contained, very sterile environment that there's, those are the pieces you move around and it doesn't have any effect on the neighbors. It does have an effect on the neighbors. So what I wanted to do was put you on the street where we, where we clear some area here. If you look across the street, this is what the check writer residents are gonna, or the, uh, employees are going to see as they depart their building. When they go down their driveway and look to their left, they're going to see the BD residence. Across the street from that is where the gym is now. And you can see how looming it is right on top of them. If we go up that street and you look at the space that's available, uh, this is another question I had is whether that handicap ramp is really necessary. Uh, they've got it at a side of the street where there's no sidewalk, and they've got right next to it a driveway. If people are going to come by and drop off a wheelchair on the street to go up this ramp, doesn't make sense, they would drive up the driveway. Don't know if it's necessary, that's your call. Uh, continuing up the street, though, uh, you can see where the driveway is going to go in and, and the Gay with Hall there. Now, we've looked at 
this part in front of the gym, I'm gonna take you on a stroll back around the back. And we'll go through that pretty quickly. If you look over to that left side, you see that L-shaped open area? That's that old uh, playground that's there. That's Gaywith Hall on the right. Now let's just walk back that road and you'll see open space. A lot of open space, all behind the uh, Gaywith Hall. Let's go around uh, Coolidge Hall and we're behind Adams Hall. Let's go look down the driveway. This is what was asked the question before about what, there's all this driveway back there now. What's going to happen to it? Exactly my question. I've got a solution. Put a parking lot back there. Look at the space that's behind their building. When you're standing where this picture was taken and turned to the left, you see all of this space. There's a lot of pavement there already, and there's a lot of additional open space. Continuing around, you can see the views of what that property, uh, or what the uh, gym is in the place. You can see right across the street, the president's house, and again, how close it is to it. So the, the summary I have is that there's some specific things that I would suggest be done. I believe the parking lot border should be moved back from Round Hill. I believe it can be also moved away from the Pratt House. And there's plenty of room in the back to do it. The good neighbor aspect here is they want to keep that open space for themselves. They want to have their courtyard, I heard it called tonight. And they want to do it at our expense. The resident, the neighbors and also the residents of Northampton. Anybody driving down that street, you've got the decision to make. Do you want to have them looking at this parking lot or do you want to have them looking at some green space with some nice landscaping around it? That's it. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. James. I appreciate the effort you put into that. Well, I think Google Earth. <laughs> Good evening, my name is James McDonald. I live at number 230 Crescent, which is an abutter of um, the property at the bottom of the hill. And I brought up a couple of questions last time and I appreciate Mr. Levesque um, having put time into answering them. One of them was to do with the screening along the driveway. Uh, that seems like it's a good uh, solution. So, so to clarify, you would actually get the headlights from that turn. So my property is right here, mm -hmm. and my concern was that when cars started to come in, it would shine right in to me and to my neighbors along with this. But I, I think that the, the solution of these plantings seems to be um, a good one. And I think that Ms. Mish brought up a good point this evening, which was if it's not um, something like an arbor vitae, which is green from the top to the bottom all the time, but it's a white pine, and in five years' time, the screening may not be adequate. And I hope that the board will take into account the point that she made. Um, and I also um, was wondering if I, I didn't quite understand, I uh, was wondering if Mr. Levesque could explain again, the plan with the curved driveway, because that was a concern that we had, was that if the curve and the, the drain, if you want to call it a drain or a gutter, if that was taken away, I didn't quite understand what the new plan is for that, if, if there's going to be an existing drain of some kind. You're talking about the access road off the The path. access road and the, the gutter that goes next to it. Okay. Um, and then just a couple quick things. One of them is that I've lived in Northampton for many years, and I've seen a lot of the projects that Tom Douglas has done, and I appreciate his work, and I think that he's added significantly to the aesthetics of, of Northampton. Um, it. Thank you. Can I it's take a break from the questions from the community and ask you to answer the, <coughs> can you repeat for us what the plan is for the access road? You mentioned that it might get seeded and that it currently does run water off into Bancroft, doesn't it? So um, what we could do to stop that would be useful. Okay. Uh, there's a number of things going on. First of all, what's happening is we're creating the parking lot right next to the boiler house, okay? That will intercept any water that's currently coming. Right now, a lot of water comes down between the en engineer's cottage and the maintenance building. Okay. So, uh, and, and actually, the system that we, this drainage system that 
we have there basically in major storm events because of the hydraulics will surcharge those catch basin structures and doesn't accommodate all the water. So less water should be coming down the slope from up above, first of all. That's the first point. Um, anything from the boiler house now will be collected in that parking lot and be infiltrated. And then if it does overflow in a major storm event, it would go to Bancroft as it does now, but it would go, it would be accommodated better. Okay. The, the, anything that lands on the slope going down where the driveway was will now infiltrate because there will be no impervious surfaces. As you get to the bottom where the, the roadway curves, there's 60 feet from Bancroft in that will remain and will leave that paved waterway and that will continue to intercept water and then run out to Bancroft. We anticipate that... Um, no. Does that mean that you're just, you're, we're keeping everything, that roadway from there to there? No. Retaining that? Just to, just to clarify, there's 60 foot portion here that will be left. And that's a fairly level piece there, yeah. but I'm interested in what happens right. between the end of that 60 feet and the parking lot, because there's a big elevation change there. It will be removed, loamed and seated and stabilized. Great. Can I just ask, is the 60 feet where the curb is currently? I'll draw it for you. This area will remain, will remain. This area will be removed. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, are you in the sweater in the back? It's not quite well, it's a... You, we need you on the microphone, sorry. It's a, it's a public record, open meeting law, da 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 da. Raphael Atlas, 70 Hillside Road. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Three paragraphs will take about two minutes to read. I actually was surprised to hear about a meeting called Among the Neighbors last December. This is news to me. The Planning Board has facilitated a situation in which a 116 car parking lot is proposed to be sited atop the highest hill for miles around. To get a sense of that capacity, imagine the lot in front of the stop and shop proper which is nine by 17 parking spaces and cut off one row. At the same time, a pedestrian access that neighbors have been using routinely with the blessing of the Clark School for decades to walk to work, to walk to errands downtown, what have you, with not a single incident, that's going to vanish. Increased access for motorists, diminished access for pedestrians. In 2016, that's planning. In the last words uttered at the meeting two weeks ago, the applicant's representative assured the board that there would be growth twice. The pronouncement was made as if this would be a good thing and as if this were something the board was happy to hear. We were also told that the traffic generated by the proposed project won't be as bad as what the board approved four years ago. A reasonable person could be forgiven for reading these statements together as a guarantee that proposals for more traffic generation, excuse me, <coughs> for more traffic generation and more parking lots and destruction of more century old trees are in the offing. In the first words of the meeting two weeks ago, the chair told the applicant's representatives that the board ultimately hoped to provide constructive recommendations so that the proposed plan could move forward. The question now is whether the board cares to muster any of the same solicitude for the scores of private taxpayers in the immediate environs. Our chief objective is not profit extraction like the LLC. We live here. If a parking lot is to be approved, I would urge the board to stipulate as a condition the establishment of a sufficiently dense all-season green screen which will require some maintenance in the first years. Pines are not sufficiently dense, and I have to say, I, I, I haven't been able to look at the plants since they were submitted this afternoon, I guess. I've consulted with the chief arborist at Smith College about green streams, and he has suggested green giant arborvitae is one of the best choices. They're easily available locally and not expensive. Someone obviously made the same suggestion years ago at the Clark School. You can see a row of these on the south side of the access road to the west campus. Those slides that Mr. Douglas showed that featured the solo lamppost, that row of arborvitae was in the back and on the left. The school itself planted them some years ago. They're dignified and appropriately staggered as they are, they block view. And while they're not yet quite high enough to hide those glaring lamps from the neighbors, when they get sun and are adequately maintained in the first two years, they can grow more than a foot a year to reach dozens in height. More recently, Clark planted a row along the west side of the access road, abutting properties on Langworthy, and I understand there are some by the Pratt House as well. There are other choices, of course. Even so, 
If a sufficiently dense all-season green screen is established, as Ms. Mission understands, it will take well over a decade to become effective. But again, the main question now is whether the board is willing to require such protection for the residential neighborhood from the stop and shop size parking lot to the LLC it has welcomed up the hill, which we are warmly assured is only going to grow. Thank you. Next. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Ann Dengendorf. I live at 88 Round Hill Road. We are next to the Pratt House and very close to the parking proposed parking lot. I'd like to read one paragraph from a letter from Mr. James McDonald that was submitted. Uh, he does not date the letter. The LLC received substantial federal tax credits in return for agreeing to preserve the historic buildings and the trees. At the time of the sale, a representative from Opal told the planning board that no trees would be taken down in accordance with this agreement. Now, as I have lived here for almost 12 years, I have walked down Round Hill World and I submitted a letter to the board, to Carolyn Mish, about the uh, trees that are existing now. And as my husband stated about the entire environment, as we looked at these trees every day, they were absolutely beautiful and in very good condition. Now as I walk along the road, I see that a lot of them are dying. So therefore, and even the ones by Pratt House, there's one tree that they said they could save. There is a disease, and I've talked to the tree commission, Mr. Um, J. Gerard, about the condition of the trees. And he has told me that there is a disease that is uh, going to kill these very large beech trees. Not only that, the trees that are on the entire campus now are in very, very poor condition. And I don't understand if, the, if they are uh, uh, they are to be taken care of. Why have they now been in such poor condition? And not only that, they are a, a terrible liability if a huge branch came down, which did come down, as I stated last meeting, came down uh, on the Pratt House property uh, right in between the uh, uh, applicant's property. So I would wonder why we are looking at a beautiful beautiful proposal of apartments on the site while the entire property has been let go. They have recently hired a landscaper to at least mow the grass there. And this has been a pristine property. I know the men who have worked there on the Cl former Clark School property and it was always kept in beautiful condition. And now when I walk down there, it's just really a, a terrible sight to see. So I would implore the applicant to at least take care of the trees because if they are trimmed, C.L. Frank had taken care of those trees for years. So if they are taken care of, perhaps they could be saved. Some of them could be saved and not uh, die because if they die, all that screening will also be gone. And some of those trees are very, very large old growth trees and we would hate to see them be destroyed. Thank you. Thank you. Hand, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Arvid Nelson. I live at 250 Crescent Street. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking. This has been a really long process for everybody. Thank you so much to the board for opening up questions for another night. I, I will be brief. Um, while this has been a long and difficult process, I understand that tempers get frayed, but I think it's extremely unfortunate that this uh, hearing was opened up with personal attacks and I feel it's necessary to address some of the things that were said earlier, so I'd like to do that right now. Uh, first of all, none of the concerns that any of my neighbors have are shocking or strange. That's not true. These are genuine concerns that we have, nor are these comments for comment's sake. That's not the case. Please take these concerns seriously, because we take these concerns very, very seriously. I also heard a comment that one of my neighbors, I think I know to whom Mr. Sedell was referring to, had um, launched some kind of campaign of threats or intimidation. Um, I know the person that he's talking to. I find that very, very hard to believe. Very, very hard to believe. Nor have in any of my conversations with my counsel, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, have we ever talked about threatening or extorting or blackmail or anything like that. A comment was made, someone said they thought it was unfortunate that I had chosen to retain legal counsel. And I can explain why I did it. It's very, very simple why I did it. Because it's 
my job to protect and to advance my interests. It's not the planning board's job. It's not even my neighbor's job. I made the determination that hiring legal counsel was the best way to advance my interests and to communicate those interests to the board. That is it. And that is a completely rational, normal, acceptable thing to do. And I did it because I take these concerns very, very seriously. And I know that my neighbors take these concerns very, very seriously. And I hope that the board will too when they make their decision. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Excuse me, I have, a, I have a little bit of a cold this past week. Uh, James Winston, uh, 234 Crescent Street, Northampton. <coughs> Wife Sarah Winston. I uh, just three points. I will try to be brief. I just want to respond um, to, to some of Mr. Sedell's comments, at least as they may pertain to me, uh, the other attorney in the room. And while I realize they don't really necessarily pertain to the planning board, I want to be clear on the record, since Mr. Sedell made a comment on the record, to the extent that there is an allegation from Mr. Sedell that I ever had any conversation with Mr. Hebert, Mr. Sedell, or anyone associated with this project were ever demanded, threatened, or, or somehow requested uh, they, they do something um, is 100% fiction, and I defy them to provide proof otherwise. My second um, issue is, is regarding the, the talk about the issue with water um, on Crescent Street and the history of problems with water in basements. And I can speak for, for my family, where I grew up at 280 Crescent and others, we've taken steps over the years to, um, to take care of that issue. And, and I think it's, it's been well contained in recent years. What our concern was is how some of the recent provisions um, or proposals could affect it. And, and I know there's been some talk from Mr. Levesque about how that service road is a concern. And I, I guess one of the conditions I would ask the board to put in there is, is maybe more clarification or, or detailing. I'm still confused about how shortening that, that uh, service road, uh, how that's going to affect the water runoff that presently goes into Bancroft. I'm also unsure of how removal of trees and other work that they propose could affect. I know Mr. Lelek talked a lot about the, the drain at the top of the hill. I'm, I'm more worried about the bottom of the hill. My house, uh, Sarah, my house is actually right next door to James McDonald, um, so we know exactly what he's talking about, and also with the lights um, that potentially may be coming down from headlights uh, as well. And the last point I just want to mention that's it's kind of unrelated to what we were talking about tonight, but there was talk last week, Mr. Luck mentioned about uh, Clark School, that about all, I think he used the term about how there was always all this hustle and bustle and, and buses lined up. and. Clark School was always a residential school. So I grew up here in the 70s. I delivered the newspaper, the Gazette, up on Round Hill and Bancroft and Hillside. And in the morning, there'd be uh, very, very few buses. The kids lived there. It was not a uh, place where you'd have major traffic jams that the way may, we may have in the future. And I, I just don't know if that issue has, has been um, properly thought out. And, and finally, I. I can speak for others on the street. We had no knowledge of a December meeting uh, in the neighborhood. Thanks, Thank sir. You. Another hand? Yes, in the back. My name is Andrea Reber. I live at 65 Franklin Street, and I am new to hearing about this in the last month or so, but I just want to lend my support to the gentleman who spoke about um, the lack of wisdom putting a commercial property on the top of this beautiful hill in a historic residential neighborhood. I disagree completely with, with that intention and the use of that property in that way. I'm also concerned about the increase in traffic. Uh, 90 cars, 112, I've heard different numbers. That traffic's gonna be coming up Round Hill, it's gonna be coming down Franklin, up Bancroft passing two to four times a day with people who work there coming in and out. It's going to increase uh, uh, exhaust fumes. The air quality is going to decrease. We're all going to be breathing it. And um, 
I'm concerned. Uh, I also agree with Sarah, the, the uh, portions of Sarah Metcalf's letter that were read here about the impact on climate change from that and from no particular solar panels or anything else being included in this plan. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> yes. Sarah Winston, 234 Crescent. So I'm a little bit naive about architecture and plans, but my understanding is that once you approve their plans, lot four, they can build a house up to 2,000 feet, if I understood Carolyn correctly. My only concern is there is, the, and I appreciate the study that Mr. Sedell's attorney Sedell did mention in his opening comments, but if you do build a house and there's springs underneath that haven't really been um, commented on, it definitely could trigger floods or water in other people's basements. So if they're so for sure, you know, so certain about the report that they submitted, I just would like some reassurances for the neighbors around if there's a house that is built and then springs are triggered, what assurances do the neighbors have to mitigate their basements for thousands of dollars? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I sense we we're sort of winding down. We have to now start our deliberations. Um, I, I would ask, uh, have any questions come up that you want to ask directly to the applicant before we sort of get into our opinion? Um, Alan? Yeah, what about the suggestion that the parking lot be moved 40 feet further back? I mean, that sounds so easily done. Uh, could you explain whether that's feasible? Um, no, uh, we don't believe it is feasible. <clears throat> Parking lot location that we selected, if you, I could go back to the gentleman's um, graphic, I believe this is it. This is the aerial photograph from Google. This is gay width where my cursor is, right here, if I can get this to work. You'll see the part, you can see the tennis court. The gymnasium's directly adjacent to the tennis court. The parking here is directly adjacent to Gaywith. There's, in my opinion, absolutely no reason to impact more green space to create the parking lot. I think it goes exactly against what everybody's talking about here. <coughs> we want to maintain the campus as much as humanly possible. We're taking down the building. We're reducing the impervious footprint within the existing impervious footprint. The campus as we know it will remain around this area. We, we feel strongly that this is the proper approach. Other questions? That curve place with all the parking is already impervious, already parking. Correct. Um, can't move back in there at all? There are some beautiful oaks. I mean, you're talking about a gorgeous, a gorgeous inner campus area. No, I think Ann's asking you about you, how much of that parking lot constitutes your new parking lot, how much space. We're, util we're leaving that parking lot in place. The behind Gaywith here is being reconfigured slightly and repaved, but the curved area is going to remain as is. Other questions? Do you still have the slide up there that shows the the cross section of the view from Round Hill. There's a question about buffering, more buffering from Round Hill, pushing the parking lot back. But I think that slide. Yeah, I think the slide does a good example of showing why we haven't added additional buffering from Round Hill. And I actually have some of my own photographs that I took the other day showing what's there now and also showing the, let me get the right one here. took some pictures. This is of the Pratt House. Bear with me for one second. So here's some photographs that I took. So everybody's concerned about the view from Round Hill. This upper, the upper left photograph shows you the curb uh, on Round Hill and then the slope going up and then the gymnasium. 
If you look at the lower portion, that lower concrete portion of the gymnasium, the wall will actually be back from that. When you're standing on Round Hill, you're looking up at that gymnasium now. You'd be looking up at that, uh, that, that natural stone wall that we're proposing. You will not, from, from that corner that they're talking about, that 35 <coughs> foot dimension that the gentleman had showed in the plan, from that corner, you're not gonna see the parking lot. You're looking up and you're gonna see the wall and we're gonna, that'll pretty much be completely screened. So there's a couple Coosa dogwoods in front, um, right in front of the um, gymnasium. Those won't be impacted. We did talk about the hemlocks last time. As you can see, there's really no screening available from the hemlock. The hemlock is, you know, they basically start, there's probably eight, eight or 10 feet of the hemlock that's, yeah, it really has no vegetation on it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I answered the question, but happy to clarify if I didn't. Did you do any, um, you know, this was a, an active campus. Um, did you do, when you were looking at traffic um, before and after uh, comparisons? Did you say traffic, sir? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, there, there was, there was, initially there was, there was trip generation studies done with the Opal proposal. Our new proposal is actually reducing based on the use type in Gaywith. Uh, we're excluding that 20% medical component. So we're actually reducing the, the, the uh, anticipated trips. And did you have any estimate or, or information about how that compares to what traffic had been previously? <laughs> Under the when it was school? operating as a school, I do not. Yes. Um, so there was a comment or a question about um, the reason for the sign uh, on the corner of the parking lot. Could you speak to that? I actually thought it was a great location for a sign. The walls, uh, it's a beautiful wall. Um, but you know what, Jim? To be honest with you, I'm not sure that Mr. Hebert really um, necessarily needs a sign in that location. This is on the north side, the north corner of that wall, where it wraps around where the, the gymnasium is. I feel about that. I didn't know we were putting this on there. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think at the entrance to the curb is appropriate, but it'll be. That's what I was. Yeah, I think, think it's safe to say that we could forego that. It's at the entrance. I, 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 but I, it would be an easy win to take out the Sounds other. Sounds like we're not opposed to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, is there any um, sign lighting? I would assume they would like some. It would be probably up lighting on the, uh, there's, the wall would be there and with the, with the, with the okay. check writer's logo. But it, it would uh, meet dark sky, it'd have to meet dark sky even for sign lighting. Okay. Thank you. Well, and that, that doesn't typically come to mind as being up lighting. We, we can mm. sign it down on the sign. On the access road, you said it was essentially all coming out except for 60 feet? In the back. In the back? Yeah. What's the purpose of the 60 feet? We're just maintaining the curb cut in the event that they do something down there. It was logical. They be a very something. suitable access for a single family home or two family home. You're talking about the quote lot four? Yes, ma'am. The place where the playground was on the side with, are you pulling that stuff out and turning that into lawn we it's we gravel could loam, yeah it could be loamed and seeded so you can take the gravel out and turn it into grass correct mm -hmm. so for us to consider a second curb cut it generally has to be for the purpose of safety mm -hmm. and i haven't really heard that argument i'm i'm I understand you're limiting the second curb cut, which is the original one compared to the one you want to put in. I see the logic in wanting to put that in, but I want to have a conversation with you about getting from 24 to 36 inches. And I'm very sympathetic because I've lost a tire to that <laughs> myself. But I, um, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with widening the radius to get to a much larger than 24 foot driveway for the entrance so so the current entrance i'm sorry the proposed entrance would be somewhat non-functional with vertical granite curb for certain vehicles getting in so we would recommend a wider it's just the radius the actual width of the road we have no problem with 
it also is a factor of geometry and how the street line, how far the street line is from, how do I say this? The street line affects how those, how, how wide of a, how big of a radius we need on either side. Carolyn, from the right, am, am I right in that we have usually been speaking about a 24 foot curb cut? the width at the curb. At, the other thing is you could do slant-based gra uh, granite instead of vertical, and mm -hmm. that would help. Um, mm -hmm. And it's certainly not wider than 30, which is what is the maximum allowed in the commercial district um, in, you know, if you were to compare it to that. But I think you could, instead of having a vertical curb, potentially um, open it up a little bit with a slant. Is the, is the concern that the road itself is narrow, so something trying to make a turn in is not going to make it in? Oh, uh, that's part because of the it. road itself is narrow, not just right. the right. Yeah. Yep. So I think some. It's also to slow down traffic coming in and out of parking. Well, no, I get that, but um, I mean, it, that's where the we're trying to work the balance out between. Well, I think the I, I think the biggest issue would be delivery trucks, but you could create a mountable curb or slant curb that the trucks can yeah. go over, okay. so that the normal traffic is not, um, you know, is slowed by that narrowing. Any th of your thoughts about whether there's an argument for the second curb cut? Or are you satisfied with the bollards closing off the first one? Um, not really. I mean. I, I just I get a sense that maybe it would be valuable to the developer for things happening down the road, but just for what's in front of us, I don't really uh, see the the reason the safety reason, and if it's for deliveries, is it deliveries to check riders, and then who's going to coordinate? taking the bollards out and putting the bollards back. I just, I don't see it as a workable solution. I guess, just, I guess I saw it a little differently, just that <coughs> it provides a quicker access onto the property. Therefore, whatever disturbance there might be along what I guess is the southwest side is reduced because it's in the middle of the property and it, you know, trucks, whatever, they're into the property quicker and it's less obtrusive or intrusive, sorry, to the folks. Instead of driving all the way around with headlights or noise or whatever, it, they're, on, they're just onto the property quicker. And I didn't really think about it from a safety thing. I just, it seemed like you're going to, if you're going to have that traffic, it gets it onto the property and off the street that much quicker and less, of, you know, much farther away from either side. I mean, that's just my. Can I ask a quick question? When you say second curb cut, do you mean the new one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm talking second about the existing. The new one. You're referring to. The I'm, old yeah, I was. One. I, yeah. Right, but I think the issue is if they just swapped the location of the curb cut. That's only one, and then you'd be it would be under site plan just for the new parking area. There's also a second analysis about keeping two curb cuts for the parcel. Right. So whether it may be safer and better in terms of cre creating an access point in the middle of the campus mm -hmm. and as opposed to the edge, but you still need to evaluate whether it's safer to have two. Yeah, if I could speak to the chair. So to clarify, we feel very strongly that the curb cut in the middle, the proposed curb cut, is better for the abutters and for everyone for access. It's directly adjacent to the side of the building that has all the you know, pedestrian access, everything. So that, that makes the most sense to us. We understand the concern about the two curb cuts. Mr. Hebert would like to leave that second curb cut available for delivery vehicles so that we can get the delivery vehicles back out that way in the event that there's a lot of cars parked in these areas, obviously with the reduced width that were requested through our uh, work with the, the planner and some of the requirements for the parking lot, we want to make sure that they can get back out and don't have to do a three-point turn in some of these existing parking areas. Okay, I, I'm just saying that the ordinance is pretty clear that, that it, the request of a second curb cut has to be clearly shown for the purpose of safety. I'm, I'm just haven't quite gotten, you know, I, the only safety issue I can get is just to angle down the neck of your new driveway so that it doesn't, I, I'm not happy with 
a big radius turn right there. Um, so I, I'm, I don't, I'm not, you know, we might decide differently, but I'm not happy with going to a, an opening that's bigger than 24 feet. So as, as discussed in my response to that comment, we would like to leave it at, at what we've proposed, but we can reduce that. We would just need to go to a different material type for the curb. The, the only thing I did want to mention on the existing curb cut is that when you travel down Sadie Way, the space between the rear of the property and the corner of Coolidge is tight. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, if that was the entrance to the, if that was the only entrance, uh, it would, I think, be problematic because you can't see coming the other way when traffic's coming. There's a mirror up there now, but it's not a yeah, no, I, thing I don't, to be having. I don't think it's going to serve you as the entrance. What I'm, what I'm angling for is close it. Correct. That's close it. Well, I, I think the, the one thing, I, and I think uh, Mr. Beck alluded to it, is that there are um, tenants in Coolidge right now, and uh, I think they also don't want to feel like they're abandoned. And even if the roadway's there but the bollards are there, at least people know, okay, they're on the campus and I can get there, and it's not just, uh, they're not just abandoned away from everything else. Okay, thank you. Um, we can keep talking about that. About that, about that second car cart, because we were open to suggestions on this. I'm sorry, my name is Jim Hebert. I'm not on the property. Hi there. Um, and I believe Car well, Carolyn was there. We had a technical Come on up review. so you're on the mic. I'm sorry. We had a technical review with um, with the city departments and the fire department was there, and I don't remember the gentleman's name, but he was maybe one of the deputy chief or I think you remember. I, you probably know who he is, Carolyn. Fire chief? For, was it the fire chief? I, I don't know. I don't okay. Know. It was one of the some gentleman from the fire department, and his initial reaction was at the technical review, and I don't think you were there, Michael, but um, his initial reaction was that they, we have that accessible, so that's where we came up with the, and I think it was because it's limited access to get to the Coolidge building mm -hmm. from the other side. And again, I don't know if his opinion on that still holds. That was his first opinion during a technical review. So we said, okay, well, let's leave it and we'll only make it available. Really, it's only for exit traffic um, because if we do have a tractor trailer that comes in for some delivery, that it's gonna be difficult for them to turn around in the, in the new lot. So we were gonna use that as an exit point as well. But I do believe for, for, for public safety, if the fire department requested that it stay there and again I don't know if that if that's formal or not or if that is still their opinion but that was their opinion during technical review that's why we considered keeping it we were open to suggestions on that thank you right. that's my recollection I was at the technical review and I might be mistaken but I recall that that was one of the concerns was for fire equipment so I don't know if, if that's in the minutes from that no we, yeah. we don't keep Okay. Um, minutes for those meetings. Do you, well, I don't think talk you want that to be the only one. Not going spots, around that building right. is. Yeah. It's, I mean, we don't need to get, I guess, into that amount of detail. But if there are bollards, they're probably going to be locked in place. Um, so typically there's. That some, doesn't really serve the public safety. Right, right. right. But. Well, but the, the fire work, chief, I mean, would they have do that a lot. Keys, they, they do. Keys for okay. access. Yeah. But I think that's a little bit different than saying that you know tenants in Coolidge might want to use it because they don't want to feel abandoned I mean if, right. if it's an emergency yeah. access only or delivery um, exit those would be if you are interested in seeing that kept those should be tight conditions that say these are the only two purposes for this driveway can we make the condition um, conditional upon uh, fire department review no. no you guys have to make the decision right. I I think it's certainly c more convenient for the fire department to get to Coolidge, but there's access to Coolidge the other way too. So I don't think it's a fire s a safety necessity because there's still access to the entire campus on the main road. So um, I, I think um, it's probably in the fire department's interest to um, like to keep as many options open, but they certainly, when there's at least one access, they're not uh, um, typically mandating multiple access. Okay, so I'd like to march to the heart of the story first, and that is the proposed design change 
for Galloway. Can yeah. I get some opinions from you all on that? Uh, well, I there's a question of the legal questions, and I certainly we don't have the answer to that. How do we get that answer? Um, was it not considered by the historic commission? Um, th or is it? They that, there's two separate questions. So the question is, the question in front of you is um, whether or not the addition um, or foot, footprint expansion would allow um, a handicap ramp as opposed to strictly a stairwell or elevator. Um, and that's definitely um, something the board, I think, can interpret. Um, and, you know, going back to the central question of the purpose of this ordinance, I think a lot of you were on the board at the time that this went through. So the idea is to encourage the reuse of these um, buildings that are that were built for a single purpose and are hard to reuse otherwise. And the only way to really be able to put money into preservation and maintenance of those buildings is to allow flexibility in use. The zoning was purposely written for that. Um, the idea was to also make it tight enough so that historic elements couldn't be removed because that's why the historic preservation was on. But knowing that many of these buildings have add-ons because they're 100 plus years old and as time goes on people just threw on <laughs> boxes to the sides and rears of these uh, rear um, portions of these buildings. So. Um, um, there was an allowance for taking those off, I think, but then the idea was also not to expand the total capacity of the building, but to contain it into its footprint. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what's happening here, and yes, they're pulling an, you know, a late addition down to the footprint and building it back, but it would be up to you to interpret whether or not it's still building within the footprint. That's what it says. You can build within the footprint. Um, or use the footprint. Do we have precedence for this kind of thing? Um, no, because this is this project, and then the Holly Street Church will be the second one. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think there was another, or there hasn't been another mm -hmm. church sold yeah. <laughs> um, since. Um, the zoning was adopted, and that was adopted in late, uh, early 2012 as well. Okay. But that's sort of right on the heels of learning that, um, you know, Smith mm -hmm. College was trying to divest itself of buildings, the church was, you know, shrinking, and so um, the city felt like it was important to be proactive in, in um, assisting with the preservation of those historic structures mm -hmm. so there isn't so this and then the Holly Street Church I think will be the biggest two projects that um, will be coming before you um, in terms of whether or not this qualifies for the you know the expansion and the fill-in of that little alley mm -hmm. um, again the idea was there needs to be flexibility to allow for modern access and to meet building code for elevators and and things of that sort so um, no it doesn't say in here handicap ramps but um, the idea is to meet the modern building code standards that weren't around when these buildings were built. Yeah. so Tom um, this this construction didn't trigger uh, ADA requirements for for access to the upper floors well, we have an internal elevator. It's, it's in the middle of the building. Oh, very good. Okay. It's actually, it sits okay. since the floor of the, the, the building so the is raised. The elevation was to, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, in that case, I would say the ramp is is in the spirit of which that, that law was intended or that, that regulation was intended, and it's to get people into the building, and a ramp does that and just fine. Certainly predates ADA standards. Yeah. John? Carolyn, maybe you can offer some context to this. This is just and maybe it's just my own thinking and maybe it's because it's nine o'clock, whatever. <laughs> but, so the ordinance allows for a quote unquote non-historic portion of an historic structure that's been attached to be taken down. Right. But they, the non-historic footprint remains. 
so then you can build a non, another non-historic structure onto the historic structure. So it doesn't say that. Though. It doesn't say that, but it, it just it seems like it allows you the, to take down a port. It, it's it's saying well the whole footprint is historic, but the part that's on top of the footprint is not, and that's the part I'm having trouble logically. If if the if the portion that was added is non-historic, well then I assume the footprint is non-historic as well. But if it is historic, well, then the whole thing. I mean, I have trouble separating the footprint from the part that's above. I, think, I get that's my. Yeah. And I don't know if that came up in the, you know, in the discussion of the ordinance or. No, I mean, I think that the intent was you can use the footprint of the existing building. There may be some things that make no sense in terms of historical, uh, historic architecture, um, because that's happened a lot. So, you can take those pieces off. I don't know. I don't think there was one way or the other a determination that um, the logical thing would be to take those things off and rebuild within that footprint. I, j I don't think it was part of the conversation, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities because the whole concept is make the building flexible enough to reuse. And in this case, the um, the 60s edition it doesn't function well. <laughs> Um, but it has, yeah, it has this um, capacity in s terms of square footage, both footprint and then for two stories or whatever. So how do you make that functionally use, you know, useful for the next generations? Um, because it's been there all along that way. So what about the historic preservation folks looking at this? What's their attitude then toward this sort of thing? Well, they uh, this went through for permitting, so they um, felt comfortable with the design. They haven't closed out um, the permit because they were waiting to see about the parking lot. That was the only, I think one of the, there may have been a lighting maybe in parking lot. But in terms of the building itself, um, they've reviewed it and felt like um, it was appropriate. Okay. Can I Devin? add one quick thing about that? Yes. 60s, just a clarification. The the internal walls of that building are concrete block, and they're all load-bearing, support the roof structure. So to, and it, it's a bunch of little small dormitory rooms in there, except for there's one kitchen, commercial kitchen area. So as soon as we start removing the walls, um, we start removing roof, and it just cascades into needing to remove everything, including the exterior walls, because it's all load-bearing. Um, we, we could do it differently. We could take it apart piece by piece and then rebuild it piece by piece, but it would just cost a fortune to do that. And f to, to, to make that building more flexible, um, we need to remove the bearing walls, which means removing everything. So. Yeah, I, would, I would repeat something that I said at the last meeting, and that is I, I was not in this seat, but I was on the board when we made the vote in 2012. And it, it, it was hard then, and it feels hard now, but I, I would repeat why I think we did what we did, and that was someone could have bought those eight acres, and they could have just sat on those buildings for a year, and the historic preservation restriction would have passed within that year, and then I was fearful that we could have new buildings, tall buildings. Um, I, I, I feared more what would happen to the hill than saying that we would put historic preservation on those buildings. And I think what we're seeing now is the, the difficulty of trying to do that to those buildings. And I happen to really like the design that's, that's come out of that. It's not garish, it fits in with the other building. It makes it a modern enough building so that it can be used and it's got the right sort of ADA access. So I, I still feel comfortable about that, but I wanna, that, that's where I'm coming from. Alan? Yeah, I, I I tried to read Attorney McLaughlin's argument while still listening to the presentations. <laughs> um, and I think that the section of the ordinance is poorly drafted and has a number of questions and ambiguities. But I think I would come down on saying that it allows what the applicant wants to do. I think it, uh, the filling in the center part could be, um, I think, justified on the basis of its being 
similar to an elevator stairwell. Mm -hmm. It also could be argued as being de, de minimis in terms of the overall project. And I don't know that word. <laughs> um, it's um, such a small part. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think that the language of the ordinance could be construed to allow what they want to do, although it's certainly not without an argument on the other side. But I think that's where I would come down on it. I think on the other issues, um, I am somewhat troubled by the constant references by the neighbors to what a quiet residential neighborhood it, it is. It, it is, but, and then this industry wants to come in there when the truth is that it's always been a school and it was a residential school and they may not have generated as much traffic, but since they were there 24 seven, they may have generated more noise. Um, and a business will be closed presumably um, on weekends and evenings and may turn out to be quieter than Clark School was. Uh, certainly it'll generate more traffic at some times a day, but, uh, and, and that's, that's a distressing thing. It would be distressing if I were living in the neighborhood, but I'm not sure we can prohibit it on that basis. They, as you said, Devin, it could be a whole lot worse. Yeah. They could have demoed everything and- Well, and really the traffic rule was set in 2012. Mm -hmm. I mean, what they are doing is a better situation than that. I'm hard right. pressed to, to now come back and say, you know, the, the situation that you thought you had is different to us because it really isn't. I, um, at the last hearing, I, 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 I felt that this, this wasn't a good fit and I, and I had some concerns about uh, the traffic in the street. And then, um, Carolyn, you reminded us uh, about all the granite curbing that went in, uh, I guess that was under Opal. Or yeah, right. and so it's under yeah. the 2012 permit. One hundred and three thousand dollars worth of I, I mitigation money. That. So that that w is going to keep that road in theory. That keeps that road s plowed, curb to curb. Right. Um, and that there's and, it's, and, I, and I apologize. I didn't realize that the no parking on the street had changed mm -hmm. because the couple of days I was there, there was actually parking on the street <laughs> by you know one or two cars. Um, but so 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 understanding that now I I, 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 I do want to say that I, I think this is a, a good fit for uh, that campus and, and we're not talking about um, uh, a pristine uh, green space or property this this is previously developed um, so uh, you know and and, and where and I, and I do think, I, I appreciate the thoughts of, of relocating that parking lot, but I do feel this design minimizes impact on open space that's there. Yeah. And uh, most of the parking lot now is already impervious. Right. Well, uh, and the, I mean, they're taking down, you know, buildings that, right. so you've got a roof, it's already impervious. Right, right. Um, and a parking lot and a tennis court. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to clarify, there, there's, this is not 90 new parking spaces. I think someone alluded to 90 new parking spaces. Uh, it's 36 total, I think, nine of which is in the new lot down by the power plant. And so um, I guess that would be 27 total. I think the applicant can, can confirm, but 27 um, new spaces. And then if you just remember, the, the only special permit that was issued f on, in 2012 was for the reduction of parking. Part of that, a more than 20% reduction in, in the required parking. But, part, but that argument in 2012 was made that the um, multiple tenants would be using Gaywith and that the leasable space was really not nearly as big. It was maybe, um, I think it was only 40% of the total area. So now you're looking at one tenant and then being able to use the entire building. And so that whole, and you'd never, I mean, the zoning doesn't allow you to calculate parking on a leasable area. It's always gross floor area. And this is one of the reasons why, but a special permit was granted based on that argument. So that special permit, it was the only thing um, that was um, part of that permit was for the parking. 
So in essence, it's really just sort of catching up to where our ordinance really said how much parking um, was necessary based on the gross floor area. I, I think, Devin, the other thing, the other issue about lot four, um, mm. I, although I, I was a little bit troubled because I didn't think they very clearly requested that change in their application. It, it I guess it is there in substance. Um, and I'm not tr troubled by the fact that they didn't ask for it and it's a change from the original permit. That's what they're here before the board for. And it seems to me that they have, the, they have the right to ask to amend the permit, and we have the right to grant the amendment, notwithstanding the fact, I mean, it's obviously it's a change from the original one, that's why it's an amendment. The other piece of that that is relevant is the degree of open space on the campus itself. But they still meet that, exceed yeah. it. Exceed it. Um, there was um, concerns about um, energy conservation. Um, but this is not a special permit before us. This is simply, um, so that like, really isn't anything at this point for us to even, the board to even consider. That's, no that's not under our purview. And the DPW is satisfied with um, plans as submitted? So they did have comments. I think we went through them in the last, the, last mm -hmm. the comments went to the applicant. Some of the, um, you know, there are a lot of details about abandoning lines and mm -hmm. reconnecting and doing that consistently with the standards, which I think just be incorporated into conditions, because mm -hmm. I don't know that that level of detail was addressed in, in the intervening two weeks. Okay. Um, but there was a stormwater permit issued. Okay. So lighting. <laughs> um, I actually think I was uh, glad to, to hear that they were remaining at 14 foot high, the poles, because if they, if they reduce the height in order to get the correct Seven light coverage, they would have to increase the number mm -hmm. of poles. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably a wise decision to keep them at 14 foot. Um, I, if, if this lot is also to be used by residents across the street, I don't know that I would support um, turning off the lights at a particular time, especially 8.30. I think we have to, well, I, I certainly um, want to consider safety. Um, Which lights are you? You're referring to the, the parking the lot, parking lot mm -hmm. lights. Parking lot lights, yeah. So if you've got residences that are parking there and walking across the parking lot and across the street, uh, that wouldn't be necessarily true for the large parking lot. At oh, it's no, not. You're talking about the east apartment. No, I, building. I right. thought they they mentioned about that there might be a is that temporary a temporary time where people yeah. would be yeah. Oh, just temporary. Think, yeah, mm -hmm. and that yeah, might oh, maybe. Okay. Is that true that was that was oh. that's for the shared parking there is shared parking so uh, some of the people in Rogers and Hubbard may park on the west side in the new parking lot in the new parking yeah. lot so oh. we are trying to study how to try to avoid that and if we study that and come up with a solution then we would come back and present that to you as well but it, we have made accommodations for shared parking I, I do have experience with the Sternberg lighting, and um, it, it's really uh, about the best site lighting out there yeah. that addresses, um, you know, your LED fixture. Your, your, not only your full cutoff, but it's, it, the light source is really hidden. Up. I'm encouraged that taking down some of the big lights, mm -hmm. if that's going to be yeah. a positive effect mm -hmm. there. Um, do you, yeah, and and I think we would put a temperature element on those lights that you would expect. Yeah, they're three thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, go, can we go back to the overflow because it sounds like you know it's temporary or permanent if the study <laughs> doesn't support it. Mm -hmm. So so how does that get worked into you know because one of the conditions that we were considering was you know on a timer or a motion sensor was that. So, I mean, maybe that takes care of it, or maybe there's a portion 
of the lot that is designated for overflow so that everything else gets turned off and then that state I mean I don't know what the what the solution is but my what guess is is a high probability that studies won't support there not being overflow yeah what well, I'm interested in doing something that restricts the light at night on the hill I mean it's yeah. just that simple uh, and I, and I, and I want the building to be functioning safe I understand that but I think there are ways to make those two things happen yeah. didn't didn't we just have a similar conversation about the at the uh, the uh, attendees Village building Hill. yeah mm -hmm. that and, and we, we put it on our right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was much smaller yeah that's what I'm and I thought I remember <laughs> some of the but for one there are not after a certain time only the lower ones are I, it was midnight and then motion they could opt to put it on motion sensor mm -hmm. oh because that work like if one person drives in mm -hmm. the whole hundred car parking lot lights up it could it could do it that way <laughs> it wouldn't be the way i'd want to do it <laughs> but. Well, and it doesn't have to be all or nothing i mean you could stipulate that you know it, for that situation for the scale you've got you could have the motion sensors on the building lights and people can the cars have lights they can get in and park if they're coming in at night and get to the door but if they're coming across the street, yeah, that's the that's, but if they're coming out of that lot, down something across the street, yes. then the question is, are you going to have some portion of that lot lit? All the time. Aren't there street lights? Yeah. Well, there may be. And if you, then if you, made the, if you made this front part the place where the spillover had to be, uh -huh. um, designated, that yes. would, maybe the street lights would take care of it. The and or just those lights. The design. I mean, do well, we I think that's what manage? that's what Dan was worried about. That their study wasn't very reassuring because it doesn't have an endpoint. Yes, sir. The very issues you're talking about are the things we're struggling with, and why we would like to have all the parking on for the east side on the east side. Mm -hmm. And I, I know somebody talked about death by a thousand cuts and making another plan, but we think this is an important issue. It's something we want to focus on. We've had multiple plans. We've engaged conversation with Magna House already to try to figure out if there's some way to work with them. Um, and uh, we actually even talked to Clark School a little bit about what they were thinking of doing with parking. So there's multiple possibilities to try to, but you, I think, summarized it the best. We want safety, but we want to dim the lights in, at night as much as possible. So that's well, the goal. The people that are coming to your new parking lot are the very people that are going to join these on the hill. So they're going to have every interest in in having it agreeable. So I mean, th there's that factor that I take a little bit of satisfaction in. Can we yes. just not put in uh, any restriction and leave it? Just assume that they will work out what is most. It, yeah, most well, effective for no, wait, safety it's, it's and not as absurd security. as it seems. It costs money to run the lights at night, so I mean, there's a disincentive to do it if you don't need them. But I do think that we've heard from the community such a strong, you know, it's a it's a high elevated campus. So, but to micromanage it, I don't know, and decide on a technical solution that may turn out not to be feasible, or they may be able to think of a better one even to protect the neighborhood and then they'd have to come back here again and ask for an amendment I, yeah. I don't know it's a good point mm -hmm. well I mean alternatively you could continue this just for the purpose of yep. hammering out some details and letting the applicant do some research in the intervening couple of weeks to figure out what the best way to do it is and just address those I mean yeah. that, that could be good. the because I think I think it is important to, I mean, you have curfews on a lot of different sites yep. throughout the city. I think it makes sense to have something. Originally, I think the issue about a motion sensor on the door at the Gay With made sense because the people using the building, then it could trigger and not by animals or anybody walking mm -hmm. through the lot. But, um, you know, it is complicated if there are residents across the street. Well, uh, um I feel like what we did for the attendance building was set a very low bar that any plan they came up with would probably not go after midnight you know and so I, I, there that's my way of thinking about this which is we go ahead and set something we set it just as a 
making sure that the it doesn't get into an egregious situation of after midnight there's still lights going on and off on the hill um, but I, I can't believe they wouldn't come up with a better plan if, than even that. if somebody if a resident from across the street comes back at 2 in the morning maybe we should have a curfew for them maybe <laughs> um, or maybe they just carry a headlamp yeah right there we yes, go sir. No, I, camp in the what, what about Carolyn's idea about throwing it back to them and making a decision on everything but that I did yes. just speak with Mr. Hebert. I think this would be helpful to the board. Um, there's residential, on the west side, there are residential portions of the property. So there's the boiler house and the engineer's cottage. If we were able to leave those lit a little longer, that would be great and, 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 and have some lighting there. And then as far as the, re the commercial portions of the west side, we would like to be able to, we could cut that off at, at midnight. We think we could do that instead of motion sensors, which I think would be more problematic for the neighbors than anything. Um, if we were to cut the lighting at, at midnight. Do you expect that building to be very active from eight to midnight? They do have, it's a, there's, there's different hours for their employees. We don't think it's gonna be that active, but there will certainly be people there at night. I would argue midnight is pretty late for a residential. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. from what too. we've experienced, that hasn't been what we've Yeah, and, it, and if it's, and if it's, we're talking about if it's, typically a few people right working late then maybe they just and and this might be micromanaging it too much I'm just trying to come up with a solution that they move their car up to the to the drive in front of the building you know um, I mean there's a lot of walking on the hill at night it really is yeah. <laughs> um, well, we, sorry the lighting plan is not up there is it worth bringing that up um, sure. Do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I need some help doing that. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm sort of making some topics that I'm um, conditions, uh, suggestions for conditions, and I'll sort of get to this list pretty quickly. And the one thing I had, don't think we've really ironed out is the satisfaction over Slide. the tree yeah. um, issue. Oh, uh, right. So, the um, screening or the trees? Both, actually. Um, you know, I, I, it was perverse that just l during the last meeting we got a tree protection plan. It was just exactly what I'm hoping for, and I haven't seen it. Um, so, the, in terms of the number of trees replacing these, it would be 76 two inch trees or 61 two and a half inch caliper trees. That would have to be planted, and did they get the discretion on whether that goes on their site or elsewhere in the city? Um, yes, typically you'd want to know where um, where they would be, and the preference is that they be on site or that they plant them. That we don't want the money for future planting. Um, okay, but I'm not sure that they've done the plan for where those trees could go. Yep. So that's the next time too. <sighs> Is there any provision for requiring more? That's the ordinance, that's what they have to do. Favor? It can be any size. The minimum is a two inch caliper. And and but you don't they want do it. better the younger right. you plant them. Right. Yeah. So are are we talking about um, just the the screening issue? No. I mean, those are additional trees too. But, or are they called shrubs? I mean, how well, what's the interplay? What, what, if, what if we require that they plant 25 or 100 uh, arborvita? Does that Those don't count, count as they don't count. trees. They need right. um, to be deciduous. But, but the other trees that in the parking lot, so you have parking lot um, tree requirements, those would count towards these. Yeah. Um, but you'd want, they're also, um, you know, the screening for that lower parking lot, um, as well as potentially around the Pratt House side, um, you could determine whether or not the pine is appropriate or if they should pick um, another tree, and that could be a condition. You do that quite often, or if you just want, you know, minimum three foot tall evergreen shrubs instead. Yeah, deciduous trees aren't any good for screening. Right. 
Right. That, so they come in those two categories. The, the, just because I'm familiar with this, like with Linda Manor, I mean, the board said, come back with a plan that's more amenable to the neighbors. It wasn't a, you know, there wasn't a ratio. I mean, they cut down five acres worth of trees. I mean, it wasn't like an inch for inch type thing. It was a better plan. Well, right. So in that situation, well, there are two things. I mean, one is you might want to see the final plan and what's, what, what lands, what, um, species they've picked for the screening um, but we didn't have the significant tree replacement ordinance at the time for that so this okay. is much more specific about what has to be done if we get a final plan for any of this stuff I'd like to have it sometime before we get here yeah so, so what can look at them what's your general sense about um, going to a vote tonight or calling for some information before we do that I think we should close public hearing and get additional information you can't do both, can't do both. <laughs> mm -hmm. but you I, could I'm almost apologetic to draw you all out for another <laughs> but you could I mean you could just um, say that the public comment will be based on the um, plan revisions to address you know the land, specific things and that your focus the next time is obviously going to be draft a decision based on that information yeah. yeah and that's I think that's where I mean for me what's left is that I'm not convinced we've gotten is the lighting and the trees because I think those will have when you say more. trees John do you include the screening trees? yeah, yeah. I, I think the whole I think plan. I think there could yeah. be a lot more done with the whole okay. plan that will help with Right. Some of the other issues yeah. I think that the the abutters have. So have we settled the curb cut? Oh, I, I, myself, I don't know if everybody else. In my own mind, I I'm the angle ready. Curb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, can, I, can I make a suggestion about lighting? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that we could take. Sorry if I can get this going. If we could take. Sorry, the mouse moves by itself. Uh, this take all of these parking lot lights these five sorry the mouse is not yeah, not doing what i wanted to do yeah no it's good uh there's five part five lights right in this air area right in there if we turn those all off at, after midnight but leave that one on in the middle and then leave these on by that abut the building and and provide light as you come up through the driveway and get into the building or if and somebody's walking through the campus so, um, the, I mean, I think we could cut off the, the ones that are immediately adjacent to the Pratt House and the ones that you would see down from Round Hill. I, I'd point mm -hmm. to them if I could, but I can't. But it's basically lose, leaving the one in the middle of the parking lot on and the ones over here next to um, the building on. Yeah. Did that make sense? Did, mm -hmm. Is that understandable? It does, but I mean, even looking at this lighting plan, you've got street lights on Round Hill. I just don't see it being that hard to find your way from the parking lot adjacent to the, to the street. Right. Right. Um, right. And there are mm -hmm. spaces right in, right in front right of the building. Right in front. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, right think it, I think you just leave it to that <coughs> building and the, the lot. Light. The, lot's, the lot goes turn down. The light mm -hmm. Turn it off at 9 o'clock. Yep. Yeah, not yeah. midnight. Midnight's yep. too late. Yep. Um, so again a sort of nod I I think all we're missing are the la updated landscaping plan for screening you have those you do I'm sorry you do have an updated landscape plan this evening from from your updated from the original with additional screening in two areas but but, but I think trees instead of where yeah I, I think see like it. another update well, you're talking about the lower lot in terms of replacing the pine trees with another alternative. And then what about along the, the Pratt House side, too, instead of pine trees, something else? And where, where all those replacement trees are going. Right. And where all the replacement trees right. are going. And the screening. Right. So I did meet with your planner prior to the, if I could, Chair. I did meet with the, with the planner prior to this meeting about the planting and about the screening. One of my concerns is over planting. Also, I'm not a huge fan of arborvitae. I don't know how, how the board feels about the arborvitae. I don't think it's consistent with the character of, of the campus. And I'm also concerned about planting a bunch of two-inch caliper trees around these beautiful specimen trees. 
where you have this beautiful park-like area. So I think there are certainly, there's a net, so some of the, some of the required plantings are already being planting, planted as, as part of our plan. Not all of our plants count, or not all of our trees count, but we understand that. But so there's a net between the two. There's a delta between the two. We, we understand that that would likely need to be done. We can do it on site, but I, I'm concerned about over planting. I understand that for today, there may be some concerns about screening. The, the question I had for your planner was, am I designing for today or 10 years from now? Or, and the reality is I'm really designing for 10 years from now. And that's typically the argument that, that we would make as a landscape architect. However, we understand the immediate concerns too. So if you could be more specific with, if we do continue tonight, be more specific. Otherwise, I think what we have is, is located properly and if it's a, a, a change, I think a condition could be fine. I would prefer it wasn't arborvitae, but I think there's another, there's other solutions that we could certainly accommodate that could be approved by the board as a condition as well. I, I think that's the issue is you'd want to see what the alternative right. to arborvitae is. So. Yeah, I, I agree. Arborvitae, 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 um, are terribly unpleasant. Are, kind of conventional and tacky, but come up with a better idea. Spruce. Um, that's, but what happens when the lower branches? They don't die? do the same, they don't do the same. Uh, pine does that, but spruce does that. doesn't. So spruce, spruce would be a great alternative. Fir? Um, I think the, I think the right. concern is that, at least for me, I won't presume to speak for anyone else or certainly not for the abutters, but having gone through something like this, literally next door to my home yes there's the issue of screening and there's what's going to happen today but it really is about 10 years from now how is my house going to look how is it going to sit next to these and is this going to look like a park which is what a, this campus largely is looking like it looks you know it has a very park-like feel or is it going to look like we did the most efficient thing possible and planted and got the screen you know it's not about a screen it's about creating a natural environment that accomplishes some privacy and, and screening. So I think that's the what. What's the first priority versus what's the second priority? And I feel like our plan, as proposed, has the spacing required so that these trees can mature. Granted, if you want some, a different tree, that's not a problem. But I think the spacing, generally speaking, is. Have we seen the plan? It's, it's the one. That that's that's it. Um, I can't see it. <laughs> Um, are there any other concerns? Are we satisfied with lighting? Could, could we get that settled today, do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I know everyone's tired, but it, it, it's sounding like the only thing left is the screening. And it just seems it would be so much more expedient if, if, we, if he's saying spruce. He, he knows so he, he's a landscape architect. We, we have to put some understanding that he's going to tell us the, you know, a very good viable, vi something viable to the arborvitae. I, I just think if we're, if we're continuing just for screening, I think that's a disservice. Yeah, and do we have uh, even, it, it is an A&R, but we also need to discuss lot four. Uh, is anyone, anyone going to oppose that idea? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think it's appropriate for any kind of conditions on that or not? Um, well, there are, I mean, I think that's what the zoning does for that. I mean, that's, I don't know that I would put any additional on it. In some ways, that house becomes a screen for, for the things going on behind it, if it does turn into a house. Um, it is a neighborhood of nice houses. Um, I, I know. Is it going to have to exit into this property as opposed to out? No. It's going to exit out? No, in fact, that's why they're keeping the lower uh, road down at the bottom. Um, but I think I would have to say that, you know, we've done infill zoning to try to create town residences, and that's my overarching feeling on that. Carolyn had several suggested conditions, and so we're talking about just adopting those as. Well, I think we well, might we need to go, go through, through, through them. them. But only okay. after we close public hearing. Well, and that's why I'm trying to get a sense from you. <clears throat> I think we will finish this tonight or come back again. Okay. So, uh, can I get a motion to close public hearing? Now, what that will mean is that we can't get answers to questions either. But 
Yeah, yeah it's a good time for that. Thank you. Sorry about that. I know you're all volunteers. I appreciate your time. It's trying for you, I'm sure. But um, the only thing I want you to consider about the lighting, and I, I do not oppose shutting the lights off at, at some point during the evening, um, but currently we have two commercial businesses in Coolidge right now. One of them is a financial planning firm, and another one is a law firm. And I know that, the, I know definitively that the financial planning firm does have clients come in after hours. And I just feel like if they do have an appointment at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, which I'm not certain that they would, um, that their clientele are, is, are not driving into a dark parking lot. So I just would like you to consider that. Um, and there are going to be, the, the proposal is for three residences in the boiler house now, one in the cottage, and three residences in Adam's house as well. So there's going to be potentially um, 10, 9, 7, 8, 9, whatever um, folks living on campus. So I just want to just please consider that for all lights out at a certain time. I just don't want it to be too early. And the other thing is we are, we do have a historic renovation planned for Skinner, which abuts the Pratt House now. Um, and that may w very well be commercial as well. And um, of course, you know, we're, we're very considerate about, about low impact. We're not looking to put a health center in there or anything like that. We know that there's, there's, there's things that are appropriate for the area. But my concern is that to make this whole project work, it has to be economically viable as well. And it's, um, we have to attract folks that feel feel that their clients can come come there after hours if they if they need be. So I just ask you just to consider, you know, like an early shut off time. I think might be, um, I, you know. I think so, we'll discuss you know. it. Thank you. Um, so, um, we'll motion, motion to close. close public public hearing. Hearing. Second by John. All in favor. Wait, does that, so does that mean we just foreclose the possibility of getting a revised lighting plan? Mm -hmm. Yep. If yeah. we close the hearing, we okay. can't. Yeah. But I think that's what we, we actually will set what the lighting plan yeah. will be. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, Dan, do you want to start with the condition? Yeah, well, so do we have to go through well, I, I, maybe I could go through and just see if it, if any of these things are relevant or okay. you want to change yeah. or what have you. So, I, um, I think that um, the you know there's an issue about the um, having the trees evaluated for tree protection. So prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall su submit a report from a certified arborist showing the tree protection measures required for the trees on site that are shown to be saved yes. um, and that uh, methods shall be, uh, protection shall be installed before any site work. Okay. Um, and then, um, so then prior to a building permit, the applicant shall present a plan for approval by staff showing compliance with the tree replacement either on site or through plantings on public right of ways. Okay. Um, prior to site work or demolition, all construction controls to protect structures and mechanical units on the Pratt House shall be installed. Mm -hmm. I don't know if um, uh, well, installed as necessary. Yeah, or? and actually, uh, they've submitted in, uh, something and that they actually spell out dust control. So they've already. Those are notes on the plans. They've already committed to that. Oh, okay. So I think we're good. So do you want that um, just prior to site work that the construction controls as um, submitted shall be in place? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so parking lot lights turned off. Well, I, I really like the idea of nine. Um, I could consider ten. Um, the, the piece I'd like to separate out and help me if I'm thinking about this right, but is the safety issue is at the doors and getting in and out of the building. I don't see that parking lot as being dangerous or unfriendly at mm -hmm. night. Because of the street light? <coughs> there, yes, there is street light. And, I, and, and the building lights. And the building, and the building yeah. lights. And there's parking along, That's right. right along both the edge building there. frontages. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, I, I'm wondering whether, you know, those would be on motion sensors and timers, and then the, the central ones is eight lights that would be, they would just be hard. They would be hard off at 8.30 or 9 or whatever we decide. In the larger lot, this the, the new lot. lot. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Is that, is that clear? Uh -huh. On the plan, okay. So building packs would be on the sensors after nine. Um, what about the other lights? For the residential. No, well, just down, oh, I or think still down the driveway. You're talking about all the site lights except for the new lot at the power plant? Yeah, I am, I am swayed by the idea of the residential lights being different than the commercial mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. activities mm -hmm. up, up there. So, mm -hmm. um, and we would not, if I wanted to put a light on my house, I yeah. could do it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to, not restrict that, but I, I think the point to there is it's probably different. And I would say midnight for those, or, or. Well, they just. Well, motion sensor. I mean, those could all be on the motion sensors yeah. after Again, after eight thirty. Yeah, at, at your well. house, you don't you don't have to turn it off at a certain time. You just have to make sure you're not polluting, you know, mm -hmm. across I, your your lot. I think it's just it's that density of. Right. lights in the yeah. lot that the lot is the big with no trees or anything to break it out that is even small trees yeah. so for all the site lights but the power plant um, parking area is that what that's called the power plant parking mm -hmm. area I don't know I made it up Condo. Mm -hmm. um, so to review the lights in the main lot are off at nine building parking lots are on sensors and the residential lights are on motion sensors after nine is that what right there yeah Building, uh, Is that the way it was at the uh, men's auditorium? So all lights mm -hmm. are on a timer off at nine, and then residential and building, or whatever you call those, those are on motion sensors after nine. But the main, the main lot, the main parking lot lights are off. Thoughts about that? I like it. Mm -hmm. Alan. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let me just make sure I got that. Um, so the with the parking lot lights um, um, off at nine, mm -hmm. but that doesn't include the lower lot for the power plant. Right. No, it does include that oh, lot, okay. but well, it, it's on sensor. The parking lot lights are off at nine. The building packs and the residentials are on sensors after, after nine. nine. Okay. Um, secondary driveway. I'm not bothered by having two driveways. I mean, it seems like it'll facilitate better uh, egress and uh, in, ingress and egress, um, get people in and out faster, well, and be safer for emergencies. Yes, yeah. I think for, I think there is a safety concern that was expressed there from the fire department representative, and I, you know, with the bollards in place. I think it limits how it gets used. Um. Okay, I'm, I'm comfortable if we put the bollards up. I, I, yeah, I think there's always a good reason to have a, a do you think that, way. Did you want to restrict the use or just have the bollards? I, I think for use. future development that, that would, I don't see that we would want to restrict use, right? Well, yeah, could we might for, for that very reason, we might want to use for future development. So, you think, so you're saying even uh, future development back there, they would all come through, um, okay. Right, because so otherwise the bollards would come out. Yeah, you're right. So it really is for deliveries, uh, emergency Emergency access. and deliveries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, but it's there. It's not like you're putting it in. It's already yes, there. Yeah. So. Um. Yep. Oh. So uh, CO, prior to a CO, uh, as built, 
plan stamped by a lighting engineer to show that the lights are in compliance. Yep. Um, with the plan, not the district. Okay. Um, and we just discussed the southerly driveway. Um, well, uh, but this is about light posts. Yeah, yes. so I don't know if you, if the light posts there are proposed to, looks like, stay the same. Do you want? Uh, well, um, That's all the green ones? Yeah. I would. Uh, Do you need those light posts if you're only using that for no. emergence? No. no. Deliveries, deliveries no. are going to be right. during the day. They should light. come out. And those are on the south side mm -hmm. of the driveway. Yeah. yeah. So disabled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we did mention and got agreement on uh, limiting uh, one sign to the entrance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what about the curb cut? Did we do any talk about that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So 24 feet, yeah. but could be. Um, I mean, that is just standard. That's what we imposed on everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly in a residential area, mm -hmm. I, it's a hard argument for me not to go to. Yes. Um, it still should be granted, but they could do slant. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, Did you already cover plant a screening and trees? No, not yet. Well, we'll get I, have it, I have it down. Um, mm -hmm. Then there's some DPW um, issues about the drainage um, staying on site and manholes and abandonment <coughs> and things. Um, and my connections. Um, any, we, there was no discussion about deliveries. I, I had that in there's a possible condition about delivery times, mm -hmm. but I don't know that it makes no, okay. mm -mm. Not as a condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so um, any trees over 20 dBH taken down on lot four for the development of the residence shall be replaced in accordance with the city's tree replacement ordinance. Um, and that condition shall be located, shall be identified on the, and the tree layer shall be put on the ANR plan so it's clear for any future user. Um, Um, so there's one, so we can talk about the screening now. So um, you had mentioned a three foot high hedge. Well, no, I think that's the point. It needs to clear three feet above. Oh, the parking right. Right. oh, oh gotcha. Feet, six feet mm -hmm. above the start. Well, I don't care well, that they plant it wherever it is, but that it yeah, clears it's three, be three feet, feet above, above the parking, above the parking lot. Lot. perfectly happy with the spruce tree. I am too, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a nice. I like those much better than our variety. Yeah. It shouldn't yeah. be my opinion, but I just think that. Well, I think it fits in better. The logic of pine is problematic mm -hmm. for me. Right. Okay. Um, and then spruce on the east um, Pratt House border, too. Do we want to specifically limit it to spruce or some other type of swell? It might get kind of monotonous. To yeah, is this just some way to say that? It Lose bottom, better. Yeah. and it needs to meet top, and yeah. I don't, it doesn't matter what goes in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so well, a full height, a full screen. Yeah, but we don't want to dig down. No, don't. Yeah, I was right. going to say, let them. I think it will be. Um, the, the point that we should say is, where are we talking about putting screening? Um, so it was shown here to be around the back of the powerhouse, of the power plant. It's shown on the uh, board. Yeah, and um, I don't feel like there's a problem on the southern border if we take the if, the, if those lights go away, and I I think those trees might be private anyway. I think mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. house owners there have put in some of those trees themselves. Yep. Um, Yes. Are you talking about the the bottom of that, the bottom no, parking I'm, lot? No, I'm, I'm talking. No. Okay. Well, it's a wall. I started talking about the bottom parking lot, and then now I'm talking about where the edge of the pool is 
there mm -hmm. uh, is going to have the wall right. on it mm -hmm. to cover that area. And then the other piece that I was interested in is as you come to the southern end, which is where the four green lights are right. running right there. I don't know that there's screening needed on that side. Any opinions? No. There should be some vegetation, though. Well, I think they'll have it. Right. They've, got, they've so. got to do their landscaping. They've right. got to put in right. some trees for, for replacement. Yep. I just don't think that I've got a reason to tell them to do it there. Yeah, right. nope. Did you, the, the whole area between Round Hill and the parking lot is going to be screened, right? Well, it's what's proposed. There's the wall, and then there's um, some, there's <coughs> landscaping in front of the wall, right. but there's not. Between the wall and the street. Right. Right, right. but right. it's not a screen, an evergreen screen. The wall's going to be the screen. Yeah, I'd yeah, rather, I, it's I'm elevated. The wall, is the wall going to be sufficient? Three to, foot high. Yeah. Um, you're dealing with an angle. So. And it's up. And it's up, right. Yeah, the, is, the wall yeah. isn't shown on the plan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. On the new one. No, it was on the yeah. Oh. yeah. yeah. Right. And I, I'm satisfied with that wall. I yeah. think it's going to be a nice architectural sort of, yep. that, that is an expensive solution to that problem. Uh -huh. um, Any other thoughts or notes? There was just one other thing that occurred to me. Um, so once lot four is carved off, um, you know, this could be never, this could be 10 years down the road. There is enough frontage to create another lot um, because of the our frontage requirement. So it wouldn't necessarily trigger another review by the board because it would be carved off as a separate lot. So the only issue I think would be ensuring that AXA, if that were to, I mean, this is, I'm making this up, so it's not. <laughs> It's well, not that it's in the plan, what we have to worry but about the, we don't I think the driveway access should be, there should be one driveway access and it should be shared. So if there's any point in time which another lot is created, that should be the single access point. Yeah, point. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they'd have to come after a curb cut. What's that? Would they have to come after a curb cut if they wanted to not share? No. This. Right, but there's nothing to stop them from getting, yes. you're going to get a by-right curb cut. Yeah. 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 Any more thoughts? Well, you have these other suggestions about one principal building? Um, yeah, I'm not so sure that's such a, I mean, you all decided that, um, you know, it's an infill lot. It's, that it it's this? Sense. So I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily yeah, it's have not other conditions for yeah. that. Let's see. Let's see. And anything over 2,000 square feet that's not a single family home is going to trigger site plan anyway. on its right. own. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It just says paren. Yeah. Behind it. Yeah. But so I assume you all are clarifying the planting, you're clarifying the wall. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I don't, the plan doesn't identify a wall there. I mean, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's probably one of the details. Yeah, they showed in the it's it's showed on there as well. Yeah. Like yeah. a stone, yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. stone this wall. This is what they submitted, though. Or is there something yeah, they submitted? Yeah. Which number are you on? C3? Yeah. Look at C3. Y yeah, we see the... Um, the footprint, uh, just yeah. for an elevation. Oh, elevation. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if I enumerate the conditions and someone gets ready to make a motion and take off those conditions, then we could, we could be satisfied with this. We were just looking for an elevation. Okay, these aren't in a particular order. So start no. the notes. I'm sorry. Are you all still verifying wall? No. Okay. So, Carolyn, what I'm proposing is that you and I, I've got the notes from your list of conditions, and I'm going to read the conditions, and then I'll take the motion with said conditions. So these aren't in any particular order. Um, we are going to... Uh, Right off the bat, I've got a confusion. Remove the south side driveway access. Restrict access to the 
south side. Restrict, yeah. Restrict. With and volume. remove the lights. And remove the lights. Yes. Okay. Um, restrict the south side driveway with bollards, uh, and it's restricted to emergency and special uh, uh, delivery requirements. Um, and remove the lights on the south side of the driveway. Um, allow a new curb cut at 24 uh, feet wide. Um, uh, the lights would be off on the main lot at 9, at 9 p.m. The building packs would be on sensors after 9, and the residential motion uh, lights would also be on motion sensors. Uh, prior to site work, uh, construction controls will be submitted? No, as submitted shall be in place. As submitted, thank you. Uh, will be in place. Um, report prior to uh, occupancy permit, the tree protection plan, or is it a building permit? Building permit. Building permit. Um, report prior to building permit, a plan for the tree replacements. Uh, add sh screening shield to the parking lot. Uh, spruce was suggested. Uh, Lot four, identify the tree replacement requirements there and um, stipulate that lot four would have to be a shared drive. Did I get them all? Um, well, there are DPW, all DPW. DPWs. Oh, right, the DPW. Patch basins, water lines, um, drain lines, um, constructed in accordance with the DPW standards. And the sign. Um, oh, right. Sign allowed at the driveway entrance only. The new driveway entrance. Any and a report notes? from the certified arborist. And a report from the certified arborist. May I get a motion? So moved. <laughs> nope. As stated. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> I move. Uh, Approval for the site plan amendment for Historic Round Hill LLC 44-5047-49 Round Hill Road, Northampton, Map ID 31D-46, as stated and amended with conditions. Second. Second. From Dan, all in favor? Thank you for allowing that. Do we have something else we have to do? No. 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 <laughs> so, what's today, the 9th? Yes. Okay, you're all coming the 23rd? Of course. Nope. I'll be here. I'll be here. Can we just do an A&R? Oh, really? Yes. This is quick. Quick, A&R. It's Very quick. quick. They didn't bring I make plans. I make a motion. We accept the A&R. Yeah. That's in Carol instead. Second. Second. <laughs> Devin, what was the second? Oh, come on. Meeting adjourned? Make a motion. Second? No, second for an A&R. Oh, second. Where is he? Just give us the address. It's on the corner of Oak Street and Warner Drive in Florence. Call it up. Uh, that, well, I have to, who knows the map ID in Florence here? Can you draw it on the board? <laughs> yes, every once in a while. I'm going to pull it up. Why do you do that? I'm going to use the men's room. I think. No, no, no. It's not going to take that long. Don't, be, don't go. No, no, no. We're, Wait. we're dismissing. I don't know. I can't give the men's room. I mean, really. Fine. I can deal with all the noise. You know what? I'm busy. Exactly. So aren't we all going to vote for it? Yeah, yes. right. Yeah. I hear all the noise. Move approval. Move approval. Yes. Okay, so it's to divide a single family house lot into one separate single family house about two blocks from Florence Center um, off of Wall Street. Hey there.
Except I'm afraid they're going to take my face back. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor